This is the all-new Mercedes GLE, the newest generation of Mercedes full-size SUV built in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, together with the GLS that will then also feature the new stuff that this new generation introduces right now. You can see behind me, and this is the designer Gordon Wagner and also the new Daimler CEO beginning of May 2019, Ola Kalinius. And they're also taking a look at their new vehicle. But for you, we'll exclusively cover the exterior and the interior and what we can expect from driving this very vehicle. Here we can see that the GLE is in the AMG line with the diamond pin grille. That one is my favorite. Is it also yours? Also, the AMG line features more or bigger air intakes here in the lower part and this swing spoiler grille with a contrast color. Definitely a very strong appearance, even stronger than the one before. But you can also see they rather use an evolution of design. You can also see new accentuations on the front hood. And the headlamps are also modernized with a new LED daytime running like signature. By the way, with two Cs, if you can say. And this shot also represent the E-Class because, as we might remember also from the sedan, C-Class is just one swing. The E-Class has two, like the GLE, and then the S-Class, and also then later the GLS, will have three of those LED daytime running light swings, so you can always see in which segment you are, basically, no matter if SUV or sedan. And also in the front, we have the sensors right here hidden behind the logo, and, well, the inside is 2D, but since they put the outside ring in a normal 3D scheme, it still appears three-dimensional, also an interesting solution. And by the way, those ones here, the optional multi-beam LED, 650 meters of range in the high beam, but also depending on the country, we've recently also heard that depending on regulations in the country, for example in the US, some of those light systems are also reduced in the range. Well, I think there should be also an effort to harmonize those stuff worldwide. I think that's always a lot of complication then with each regulation. It surely looks fancy here in the highest trim. 4 meters 92 or 16 foot 1 is the total length of this new generation and that's about 10 centimeters longer so just a little bit and 8 centimeters of that went into the wheelbase so the wheelbase is a little bit longer so we can expect more interior space we will find out very soon. This one here also in the contrast with the black mirror caps and the black frames in the AMG line with a night package and white exterior color. You can see at the side there's just one slight dropping line used. They are rather conservative in the design layout just to add this sporty AMG line in this case then. But the overall layout is not too far away from the previous generation. And they also kept here in the rear the split in the C pillar with the rear window. And then the rear window will form one glass unit with the rest of the rear of the vehicle. And I think it's very strange. I mean, it's a big vehicle, but I think from the other SUVs also, the competitors, recently we've shown you the BMW X5. You can check out the full review, also linked in the video description. This one here looks small from the outside, or what do you think? Rims are available from 18 to 22 inch. Those ones are here are the biggest ones, AMG 22 inch rims, really massive. And you can see that here in the AMG line, also the wheel arches are painted in vehicle color. However, I more prefer the crossover look that you can really see it's still an SUV, just with the black plastic fenders. Which one do you prefer? The rear is indeed the one that has changed most, and I think this looks more elegant now with those horizontally drawn tail lamps. It was a little bit sharp right here in the design. This is a GLE 450. Soon we'll tell you more about the engines. And you can see we do not lose too much room on the inside here. That's very interesting. And in the lower part, we got fake exhaust because they are really purely fake. There's nothing. The real exhaust is just right underneath the vehicle. So, looking at the engine right here, this is the 450, a six-cylinder with 367 horsepower output, also with a 48-volt board net, so it's a mild hybrid system with a so-called EQ boost. 5.7 seconds to 100 kilometers an hour or 62 miles an hour. Then they also already announced a 350, that's a four-cylinder with 300 horsepower petrol, and there will later also be a V8 petrol, as well as a plug-in hybrid, so a real plug-in hybrid, not as the mild hybrid here is. But this one will probably be the most, you know, or the, the biggest seller 
or maybe also because of the Chinese market, even the small petrol engine. And there will also be four-cylinder and six-cylinder diesels. Interesting here, by the way, with the carbon fiber. It obviously stiffens here, the front part, and still very light. Now let's get inside. See it right here. So we have the red at the inside of the doors, also the classic Mercedes electric controls for the seat, also with memory functions. Then the optional Burmester sound system for the 3D surround sound. We can also open the tailgate from right here and also the towing hook. And this really leaves some room for bigger bottles. That's really cool. So here it is. In your interior, you can see a horizontal layout with those two 12.3 inch screens already from here, soon also from a rear perspective. Then the steering wheel with those new controls for the Distronic, the adaptive cruise control, and also those touch buttons here for left and right thumb to control either the right or the left display. Since we have the Distronic here, the separate column here is also removed. Just have the electric steering wheel control right there. And the new seats right there. This is an optional animal skin layout. Don't have so much information there yet, but there sure also will be article options, so a full leatherette or also some Dynamica options if you want to go for another surface. And also different seat forms available. So let's get inside, see how that one plays out because they actually promise that the um, A-pillar is actually a little bit slimmer. So they have a little bit more room in the front right there. And let's see, we move the seat a little bit to the front right there. And the interior really feels, feels huge. So again here, the steering column control. And when I'm sitting here as with, with one meters 86 or six foot one, we have the panoramic roof installed. There's a little bit headroom left. If you want more headroom left, if you're taller than me, then probably you could also leave out that panoramic roof. But of course, you have this high upright seating position. However, this front dashboard is quite huge. And due to the sporty design in the front, you can see that the visibility to the front is limited. It's the same they did with the GLC. So the GLK before was actually with a better visibility to the front. And here the same happened. So I think the visibility to the front has really decreased. That's one negative aspect about it. But it is surely cleaner in the layout. And you can already see this hole right there. This is for the head-up display, which is also available, which then projects everything in the front of you. So here you can see the interior overview. Everything is very cleanly organized. You can with the leatherette cover, uh, with the soft touch, really cool. And then there's two 12.3 inch screens. And they are indeed standard here. And it's good that they make something standard like this. Not that you have like, again, three different screen sizes or something. Here you can already see, by the way, there's a proximity sensor um, for the touchpad, for the lower touchpad, both and for the screen right here. So before you actually touch anything, something is highlighted. And there's another special function we're going in depth very soon. First of all, let's continue with the interior overview here. You can also get wood trim, for example, with a, um, a matte wood trim. This one here, the sporty aluminum style. Here they do not use the round Mercedes vents. They want to be more rectangular to have a strong design also on the interior. Then the steering wheel you can see here with the thumb, you can control the right infotainment system. But it is also a touchscreen now. This one is really helpful to have multiple usages and you can also use the lower touchpad. So it's basically redundant. You can pick how you want to control the infotainment system. And that's of course then really helpful to get you know the stuff you really like. Very big map here as well. Crystal clear display, I like that. And the smartphone connection will be available with Bluetooth, but also with the Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. So with the left thumb then here, you can control the left screen right there. You can, for example, also change the styles. I'll put the steering wheel a little bit more inward. So, for example, understated this is a very, you know, basic, clean setup. Can we see that, Holger? From Yeah. Okay, great. We can see that. Um, Go back again, or like a sporty gauge, like this. It has the sporty AMG style. And um, then you can also have, for example, navigation info just in the middle of your um, of your display right there. Um, yeah, when when the you know when the route is being picked, for example. Well, in this new steering wheel, you set the 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 gears here at the right side, 
and then let's move move in the lower part of the middle console. You have two panic handles here <laughs> with ambient light as well. Really interesting, maybe for off-road use. Then in the front here, well, this glossy black, especially on motor shows, it does collect a lot of fingerprints. You can slide it forward. Hmm, interesting opening mechanism they found here. At least metal nerd right there. Inductive charging pad for a smartphone, two USB-C devices, 12 volt power supply, and adaptive cup holders. And yes, they can again be cooled or heated. Very nice. The climate control is still manual. They also thought about a nice clicking sound, also the vent strength for, for example. So good to have it still manual that you can, for example, do it while driving in an easy way. This touchpad here, again, is another possibility. You can also zoom in and out, like with this pinch gesture. And then you can also activate the camera system from here. Other buttons right here, for example, for the suspension, since you can get different suspension, you have a standard suspension, you have an air suspension where you can lift the car up and down, which we have here. And then there's a completely new suspension I will soon tell you more about. Finally, we can open this middle part, have USB-C support. Maybe a second one wouldn't be bad there either. Again, again, good build quality everywhere where we can see it. This new MBUX system, by the way, also features, introduced with the A-Class, a new voice control. Hey, Mercedes. How can I help you? Set temperature to 22 degrees. Temperature is 22 degrees. Navigate to the next Mercedes dealer. No results were found. What can I do for you? Hmm. Navigate to Stade de France. Please say the destination. Paris, Stade de France. Can you say that again, please? Hmm, doesn't know that stadium. Let's say uh, Saint-Denis. You can enter a destination by saying an address, a point of interest, or the name of a contact. Additionally, you can navigate to one of your saved addresses. What is your destination? Berlin. I am starting route guidance to Platz der Zeitin, Moors, Berlin. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, hmm. You know, it's a good system for setting the temperature and quite often it also works for the navigation. But you see, maybe not always for all destinations. Let's see where that was set now. We are in Paris, of course. Well, that takes some time to process now. It might have also to do with the GPS connection. Uh, yeah, here we go. Here we go. Come on, come on, come on. So I'm passing Cologne and yeah, actually the car wants to drive to Berlin, but not to the Stade de France, the stadium in, uh, here in Paris. Hmm. And for a special function, we are also joined by the product developer here of the infotainment system, Volker Entemann, because there's also a new feature which can differentiate with the camera between driver and co-driver. How does it work? Yeah, we call the system uh, Interior Assistant. And the uh, uh, interior system works with a camera which is installed in the roof of the car. And the system can distinguish between driver and co-driver operation. So um, you see here, as soon as I approach the screen, I get a highlight of the icons. And when I activate uh, Comfort, you see that my seat, the passenger seat, is now automatically uh, highlighted. And if you do the same from your perspective, then uh, you get a highlight of the uh, driver's seat. So the supports in select... Maybe, maybe you, you select again that we can... Yeah. And, and we can also demonstrate that it works with a touchpad. So when I uh, have my hand close to the touchpad, um, also here it is recognized that it's me. And when you do the same, then it's uh, you again. So this is one key feature, this passenger versus driver distinction. And uh, even more, uh, we also have uh, a favorite uh, function. So uh, you have here your favorites, and you see here this uh, V-pose. Uh, and you can assign different uh, functions for the driver. So now you have activated the ambient light. When I'm doing the very same pose, I can directly access uh, the seat menu. 
So this is very flexible. You can actually assign any function, a vehicle function or a telephone number to directly start a call or a navigation destination to directly start a navigation. So this is a core feature. And beyond we have uh, light functions, uh, which unfortunately cannot be demonstrated here because they only work uh, when it's dark outside. But you can uh, do uh, a vertical up and down underneath the mirror to uh, activate your reading light, again based on passenger versus driver distinction. Um, and when the seat is not occupied and you reach out for the seat or reach out for the glove box at night, you automatically get a searchlight here on this side. So you can surely have some interesting games then, driver versus co-driver, to uh, fight for the functions of the infotainment system. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So the panoramic roof is really large, extremely large. Here we can see how we can open it. And wow, the mechanism is super smooth. So it doesn't open too wide in the length, but it's extra here in the width is very wide. Really interesting. And there's also, of course, if you live in a hotter climate and still want to have it, there's a shade available that comes right there, a black shade. Still, it will be hotter than if you just pick the plain roof, that's for sure. Ta-da! It really takes ages because it, it's going all over the vehicle. So let's get in the rear. And the interesting thing is here, you can now move this, the rear bench 10 centimeter forward. There we go. Or backward. And the overall increase of legroom, if you compare it to the previous generation, increase of 7 centimeters in length. And when I sit here, this is massive. Wow. And if you compare that to the BMW X5, this is a massive advantage here in this case for the GLE. You can also, let's see, control the back part here. And even the headrest electronically. Interesting. So you can more be in the, this lying back position or a little bit more upright. The only thing I feel which could not be that good on the long term run, well, the bench, you see, it leans a little bit backward. So um, that's not that good for the lower pelvis and on the other hand it increases the headroom a little bit so you still have some headroom again one means 86 or six with one but with the panoramic roof it always reduces the headroom a little bit so would be probably a little bit better without it um, so yeah I think that the rear seating comfort in the X5 was a little bit better but the leg room here that one is definitely better with the Geely well why can't we have it both? I don't know. <laughs> and Isofix on the outside of the seats. Then we have here some storage room. Also cup holders can flip out. There is of course a middle tunnel since this one is all-wheel drive. A standard setup is 50-50 but also with a variable all-wheel drive that the torque can, um, you know, more front, more back. You can put your feet here but it looks a little bit awkward. Um, you can sit here theoretically as an adult, headroom-wise, yes, but the rear here with the um, with the you know, with the armor is a little bit hard, and you also have a separate climate control here for the rear USB-C slot and a 230 volt socket, maybe for recharging your laptop. Well, and then even more interesting is also that you can also flip those seats electronically. Here we go. This is, for example, when I do it from here and then they raise up because there will also be a seven-seater version available. It's not with this very vehicle, but if you have the seven-seater, this would be the way you enter the third seating row. Of course, this will only be used, you know, for smaller people or children. I hope they think about Isofix um, in the rear then for the sixth and the seventh seat. Then it would make sense. Other than that, the real seven-seater car will, of course, be the GLS, which will be basically a longer new GLE then. Then you will also be able to better use the third seating row. So, now the truck area. 825 until 2055 is the liter capacity. You can see very well usable also in the width. Check here. This is pretty interesting because you can store the floor cover here. That's nicely done. You can optionally also fit the replacement tire. And here, for example, is also available that you can split the trunk here. For example, if you have a dog or so, this is also possible. But again, you can also remove it. And we can also flip the seats from here. Oh, 
let's go yeah forward like this and then you have the electric seating fold pretty handy that comes of course oh and then you have a fold flat area of the whole trunk really nice and the good thing is you can even raise them again just here from the rear Ta-da! Oh, by the way, just right here, you can see this one here is to fold out the electric towing hook. Really cool. So, a useful feature where you can also hide it again there. And no, it's not that you have an additional length all the way standard. There it is, and gone again. And let's close the hatch, electric hatch right here, see the safety. Yeah, that's way to go, that's how it's done. So Mercedes can really do that very well. It always closes and opens, but at the same time it's so safe that it won't hurt anyone. And I wanted to talk to you about the suspension, next to the base suspension and the air suspension, there's the new e-active body control and by that they can control each single damper on every wheel and so they can for example also make an anti-tilt control that so that the car stays upright, even leans inside the corner. This is an, no, a, a further development of existing suspensions they had, but this one here completely new, especially for good use when you combine it, then it said it's also be combinable with the air suspension and also with the off-road package. This car will feature an off-road package, even an off-road gear reduction and a rear differential lock. And if you then also combine it with the e-active body control, there will be a function that when you're, for example, stuck off-road, like in the sand, the car can basically whip out the sand, you know, like go up and down a little bit like those, you know, uh, <laughs> special hydraulic cars that can go up and down. Pretty interesting. So totally new possibilities they give with this new suspension. And also let's talk about assistance systems because the Distronic Plus is now also available with a new traffic jam assistant that will go until 60 kilometers an hour so that you can basically relax then, also a partly autonomous function. And there's also a new function that when the car sees a traffic jam ahead, you can not only see it, you know, you can cannot see it visually yet, but maybe the map data and the traffic life information tells you the car is automatically reduced to 100 kilometers or 60 miles an hour. Yeah, that's something for the German motorway if people drive 180 or something, but it's definitely a very clever feature. Now to our conclusion for today with the all-new Mercedes GLE. Well, design-wise, I have to say it is one of my favorites among the full-set SUV. What about you? Tell me your comments about that. The AMG line here, of course, sporty. I think I would more prefer it in a rather elegant way with chrome around the windows and also the plastic wheel arch to make it really off-road-ish. Mercedes also claims to have still a real off-roader with an off-road gear reduction, for example, and also this new e-active body control, supposed to add more of a feature that you can basically never get stuck anywhere. Well, of course, you need the right tires for that too. On the interior, you see the new digitalization with those widescreen setup, pretty clean and impressive, the looks for sure. And also still, you know, with the manual temperature control, I liked it because we've seen that the MBUX voice activation is among the best in the market at the moment, but still, not everything is realized in every language. It's also a very complicated process. Also, the interior processing quality, the build quality on a very high level. With the rear bench that is movable, adds more flexibility, large trunk and a lot of legroom on the rear seats. That's special for this vehicle. However, I was not that satisfied that the rear bench was falling backwards, by basically. Then I got also the seven-seater function that will be available and the GLS will basically, we expect the very same car, just a little bit longer and with a real usable third seating row that you can also have adults on the third seating row than in the GLS. So far there's the all new GLE and of course we're looking forward to driving it, especially with this new suspension. Let's see more about that on a later stage and looking forward to your feedback here on Autogefühl. This is the all new BMW 3 Series or BMW 3er as we say in Germany. This is the core of the brand. What have they changed on exterior, interior, and what can we expect from driving this car technology-wise? Here on Autogefühl, your number one resource for in-depth car reviews and your number one community to discuss cars, we will take you on a tour through all the changes 
in all different areas. And also with two different cars, two trims, M Sport and Sport Line in mineral white or in Portimao blue. So join us on this tour in full HD, full screen and full X. Let's go. The new 3 Series will be built in Munich again at the head plant and when you buy it very early, everyone will get one from Germany. Later on, there is also a new plant plan for Mexico that will then deliver the whole American market and customers in China will also get it from a plant in China. That's the basic order. And I've told you we have different trims here today. So overall, there's Advantage, Luxury, Sports Line and the M Sport. And this one here is the M Sport. So until at a later stage a true new M will arrive, the M Sport will remain the sportiest model and already very sporty in the look. You can see here, especially in the lower air intakes, very big, accentuated. And in general, the new 3 Series, well, it's defined by those more horizontally drawn headlamps. They start with LED from standard equipment then you can get an adaptive LED, which moves alongside in the corners. And this one here, the highest trim with the BMW laser light. You can see it here with those blue accentuations. Then you know that you also have the laser light. You can see a small detail right here. It doesn't go all the way straight through. There's also a signature here of the new generation. And then also the front hood has stronger accentuations and a bigger BMW double kidney. Here you can also see that is the, this adaptive kidney. At the moment, the vents are closed and when the engine is needing more air, this part here in the middle will be opened. Four meters 70 or 15 foot four is the total length of the new three series. That's about 8.5 centimeters longer than before. So a little bit longer than the predecessor generation. And I'm not sure if you've really seen it. Of course, it looks also wider in the front visually. There's also the track change. So the front track is about four centimeters wider. The rear track is about two centimeters wider. So like, you know, in this one. So in all directions, it grew a little bit. Rims start at 16 inch up to 19 inch. Those ones are the M Sport 19 inch rims. Pretty massive, of course, also in this two tone style. Then the M Sport package also includes stronger bumpers here in the lower part. Other than that, the main design line is here just over the door handles, very seamlessly integrated for sure. Then this you know, famous iconic form here in the rear part of the 3 Series, also with the dark window frame here in the M Sport, so all again set for the sporty look. But of course, the main characteristic of the 3 Series has been remained the very same. Definitely again, an evolutionary step. But technologically, there are also new changes. For example, they worked on you know, the sportiness of the car, it gets even sportier. The weight balance is 50% in the front, 50% in the rear. The overall weight is down by about 55 kilograms, depending also on the engine choice. And there's also a new underfloor cover to improve the wind efficiency. So some small technological details being updated. And a very important aspect is also about the suspension. This one here starts also as a base 3 Series or BMW 3er as we say in Germany. It starts with new adaptive dampers with a hydraulic cushion and that means that in the, you know, in the lower damper areas you also have a very sensitive area to improve the comfort but when you have stronger bumps it's still remaining stable. That's the secret behind it. And then optional, you can also get this suspension as an M adaptive sport suspension that would be the top suspension trim and then there's also a normal M suspension without those adaptive dampers if you want really the strong, stiff suspension experience. Which one would you go for? In the rear, also as the modern design trend says, those taillights are also more horizontally drawn. 
They're beautiful with this LED shape and they're also more three-dimensional. So you can see they're not all flat. They really have a structure. And real exhaust tips, yes, I mean, the outer part is just for the beauty. But I think that's totally fine with me and it looks really good with those two pipes on both sides with the 30i engine. What do you think about the new design of this generation? So for the trunk, you can also get this electric opening. I mean, for a sedan trunk, you can just also go with the base version, but also a little bit more comfort. 480 liters is the normal setup, and then you can also flip those seats. 40, 20, 40 is also standard, that you can not only flip the seats in this way, but also just flip the middle part. I'm just doing it like this, they can also load things through. You will also be able to optionally fit a replacement tire as always. So I'm gonna put them up again. Let me just show you that we can just have this middle part right there. But of course, more handy will be the touring version, the estate coming up later and it's approximately always, you know, half a year later um, after the introduction of the sedan that we'll then also see the touring version. Of course, we will keep you updated with that on Autogefühl. Today we also have a key special for you here with the three different key fobs. This one here is the base key fob you always get. This one here is then the one with the M Sport package with the M colors at the side. And then you can also get the, let's say, computer key, <laughs> the biggest one with the screen. And well, it is bigger, yes, but it has the advantage if you have the independent heating system, for example, you can then activate the independent independent heating here with the big key fob. That would be um, you know, the advantage. And if you pick this one here, the big one, you also get a normal one always alongside. So if you at some point say, yeah, you know, I don't always need it. I just want it maybe it's a little bit slimmer in the pocket. Then you also have the choice to go over this one. And for all three, very important, there's a new function. We've recently discussed it with, um, uh, with, with you guys. There's a new function to uh, save the copying of signals that your vehicle gets stolen. Because when you put them down, put them on the table or somewhere and they rest basically, they shut down that no one can copy the signal so you don't need to put it then maybe in a cake box or something to hide it from being stolen and with the signal copying. Well, keyless entry, you can open the car, put your hand inside here or put it here to close it then and door closing sound test. That sounds pretty solid as we used to. Then inside of the doors, we have soft touch material on the top part, then we have sensor tech, leatherette right here, also from a good quality. There are different styles of course available and this is also the new style which reminds at the side window frame right there, interesting. And standard window levers for all four parts. Then you also can fit some you know, bigger bottles right there, that should work, and open the trunk from there. Um, this is here also the Harman Kardon sound system. Overall, there are three speaker trims, six speakers, 10 speakers, or the top trim, 16 speakers. Then the interior, again, this was the M Sport model, so you have a sport seat, so you have bigger side bolsters, also a bigger shoulder accentuations, and the standard would then here be that you get a fabric on the inside and leather red center tech on the outside. I really recommend that seat then. Or alternative, you can get Alcantara on the inside and center tech leather red on the outside. This one here is the top spec animal skin full package. Um, this is also an extra price, also with the blue contrast situations. But you can have a lot of alternatives then, as I just said. Let's test it. Of course, the sport seat here will be a little bit different from the base seat. The base seat, by the way, will also be available um, either in pure fabric in European markets or in US markets with full sensor tech if you um, need seats that you will want to wipe clean a little bit easier. So electric controls in the lower part and, well, you feel directly at home, you still feel it's a 3 Series that hasn't changed so much. But since the car is a little bit long and also just a little bit wider, you have a little bit more room. Also, the dashboard has been uncluttered, also less buttons. You still have a CD changer, I can already tell you so far. Soon it will take a detailed look right there. Very interesting, so you feel a little bit more spacious also because here this A-pillar, the cover of the A-pillar has been made a little bit slimmer. This also increases the visibility from inside to the exterior. And by the way, the front glass is always now a soundproof insulation glass to bring down the noise for, um, level. And the side glass 
This is optional then, so you can not have this on the standard, but you can option also a side window insulation package to make it even calmer on the interior. Well, and I mean, I have this typical sporty BMW seating position here with a menu control also of the steering wheel. This also the M Sport steering wheel, this um, very thick one, and also it's a little bit asynchronous, um, that in the top part is a little bit thicker even. Um, some really love it, I'm not really sure about it. I really like it more, it's not that thick in this upper area, but sure looks sporty. And then you also have more flat buttons here at the steering wheel. I'm not sure if those are pre-production, sometimes they are. We'll see that on later because at the moment I think this could have been done a little bit better quality-wise. But again, this is the very first model that's available. And then the shifting pedals also with the automatic gearbox because most cars of those will come with the automatic gearbox. And then you can sh still shift manual in a way with those pedals here at the side. Subscribers will know I'm 1m86 or 6 foot 1 and I have the seat in the lowest position without a panoramic glass roof and this leaves still plenty of headroom so that's all fine also for taller people. This is the new interior overview by the way also then with this optional sensor tech leather red dashboard really cool quality also with this meshed aluminum style it is not really aluminum oh this is, by the way, also a new um, formula for the BMW infotainment system. As you say, hey Mercedes, you say, hey BMW or hello BMW. I wonder if in French, for example, you just can say BM then and not BMW. And then you can also voice interact. Maybe that's uh, set temperature to 22 degrees. Sorry, I didn't hear that properly. Set temperature to 22 degrees. In the driver's area, 22 degrees Celsius are already set. Ah, cool. So she said that the um, temperature is already set to 22 degree degrees in the driver's area. And let's just check that because the, uh, there, there, yeah, that's true. So pretty cool, for example, to set the temperature or um, use the GPS then and you set the temperature now right there. Very interesting. So this is also new. And you get different setups for the screens. On the left side, you start with analog instruments and a smaller 5.7 inch screen. And on the right side, you start with the 8.8 .8 inch screen. This one here is then the bigger one, the top one, 10.25 inch. And on the left side, you can get a 12.3 inch full digital cockpit. Zoom more details to those screens. Let me just continue right here because this lower part is basically mirroring the upper part. Then seat heating is right here. And this new AC unit I've just shown you. And you still have a CD changer. Some people really appreciate it for best sound quality if they want to listen to the music with, this, um, the, with a CD. And then this classic volume knob that is still left with a checkered aluminum or metal structure around it. Pretty cool. Then this part here opens in a new way. Also very interesting, a little bit complicated maybe. And in this lower area, oh, it's also light, it's practical. You have an inductive charging for your smartphone, another USB port, and also adaptive cup holders and a 12 volt power supply. In Mutainment System, by the way, it's not flickering in real life. We just have a hard time, so many settings on the camera to get it unflickering on camera, but for the real eye, it looks really cool, good resolution. Um, basically, it is also a touch screen. So here we go, and you can also set your left menus. You can connect your phone via Bluetooth, but also via Apple CarPlay. Also wireless CarPlay is of course available as you had that before. GPS can also be put in a bigger screen here. You have a good reaction time here, pretty amazing. And you can still use it or like with control with the lower controller that you can you know, do that while driving, for example. Cool, we also have a blue car in the visualization as we have one on the exterior, I like those details. You can set some more details on the right side, a G meter is also available. Um, so it looks quite fancy, this is those new digital gauges. But then again, a 3 series might also be just cool with a classic analog display that is still available. The new head-up display is 70% bigger and you can only have the speed for example. Um, you can also you know, browse in the menu that you don't have to look at the infotainment screens, for example, or have the GPS commands if you have a route mounted. So you still have this classic knob here to you know, select with nice clicking sound and press or also write, for example, when you search an address. Mm. See, 
<laughs> so that's pretty handy. And by the way, the infotainment system will now also feature over the air updates. Hotkeys right there, they are no, not really physical in a way that they stand up, but it's all integrated. You see, it's rather a flat area, also like the sport mode, comfort, and so um, the start engine button. Everything is really seamlessly integrated. You can still press it and get a haptical feedback. There are no monitors or something, but there are also no not standing out buttons. And this is then the new gear selector. Very small. And finally the armrest, well attached. And some more room here it has been increased and there's a new USB-C port. Let's now get in the rear. And since the car is a little bit longer now, also the rear legroom has been increased. I mean, it's still no rear legroom wonder, but you can see I do fit here exactly and also have still some more room in front of my knees, although I'm driving as a front passenger and the seats are quite thick, so it isn't a better result than before. But again, you know, there are also other cars who use the package a little bit better. The seating position in the rear, especially the rear seats, has been changed and Indeed, I feel it's more comfortable than before. Headroom, although we are in the sedan, there's still plenty. So it's absolutely fine. Mm, I think also in the rear, the glass roof, if you have that one, shouldn't affect it. The glass roof, by the way, is uh, now 10 centimeters larger than before, if you have spec that one. You can also very well see the ambient light here, for example, here now in blue. And LED ambient lighting is standard equipment as well really fancy. And so what else do we have here? Well, we had this you know, ski hatch. So can you show you that in the, with the trunk as well? But just to show you from here. And then the cup holders, also adaptive right there. And then if you want, there's also a new AC unit for the rear with temperature set, even seat heating optional and two USB-C ports. So, so all together you would have two USB-C ports here in the rear, 12 volt power supply, you can have this as an adapter for more USB ports, of course, if you want. And then there was one USB-C in the middle console in the front, and then there was a normal standard USB, the old USB in the very front, so you have both portabilities, or then again, use the 12 volt charger with an adapter to you know make the USB slots you really need. And now the front of the sport line, which is also sporty for sure looks pretty fancy but not as sporty as the m sport so there's you know a um, little differentiation you have to pay about 2500 euros extra for this one here comparing to the base and then another 2500 approximately for the m sport starting from this one here um, but the overall look of the new 3 series will be sport here as well and then about the headlamps again well the very base LED headlamp they just have a signature with just basically a, a straight stripe in the lower part then this one here with the dynamic LED already has this curve this let's say half U and then the top laser light has this curve that goes to the side so there you can also see with the LED daytime signature light which one of those headlamps you have picked. So what do you think? Would you rather go for the white one or for the blue one? Of course, there will also be different colors available. Here also with 19 inch optional rims. So um, how sporty it really looks between M Sport and the Sport line will rather also depend on the rim choice you will take. Then those ones here also from the BMW individual choice, so very precious ones. So the lower part, I mean, it looks quite similar from the side. The front end uh, is probably the one where M Sport and the Sport line differ most. The exhaust tips are here also very present, but you can see here that in the Sport line, you don't have this super big black diffuser style as we had with the M Sport. This is more painted in vehicle color. And speaking of a white three series, yeah, my grandparents had the E30 in white and I so wish they haven't sold that. But you know, that's all the past now, this is the older generation. So in this interior, we also have the sport seats mounted with some different contrast stitches. As I said, you can also get the different the base seat form and the sport seats also with different surfaces. Here we also have different 
decor inlet with a you know more let's say a finer structure but also bright aluminum style the basic difference here well it's not so much between the Sportline and the M Sport it's more visual differences but then also not that much interesting that here has nothing to do with the line just a general option this one here is then now equipped with the glass roof and wow you can really see the difference um, that it's bigger than before, so leaves a lot more light in the interior. And when you open it, it also seems like you know the integration of the glass roof. You can also see it then from the from the outside is slimmer and more streamlined now. So that looks pretty good. So if you asked me if I could always open it and show it from the outside here, so I think the integration is well done. And headroom-wise, well, um, you maybe lose a little bit. Yeah, so before it was like this, so you lose headroom. So if you're way taller than me, then you have to uh, refrain from picking the glass roof. Other than that, if you're you know, maximum 190 meters or six foot two, also with the roof, with the glass roof would still work. As for the rear, it does not make any difference headroom wise um, because the seating is raising again, as I was suspecting. So still fine with the headroom here. Of course, if you have the two ring, the estate later on, this will go straight onto the back, will give you a little bit more roomish feeling then. But as for the roof, it's really just a difference in the front with the headroom. So that's a fancy view, right? You know, with both hoods open. Well, it's the same engine here today, both the 30i. So this is the two liter four cylinder petrol engine here with 258 horsepower. So the, so far the top spec uh, petrol engine. And the interesting thing is 258 horsepower and it makes 5.8 seconds to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour. So you can always remember the second figure if you know the horsepower figure. 258, 5.8, you got that? Pretty nice, right? <laughs> I also get thumbs up from Michelle, cameraman for the day. Thank you so much. And then this engine is also available with a 184 horsepower spec, so a little bit lower. Of course, still standard rear wheel drive. And also comes with an eight speed automatic gearbox that is then also enabling you to use a sailing mode to save fuel when you're just rolling with the vehicle. There are still also diesels available. And by the way, petrol and diesel, they both get particle filters. And the diesel there will be a three liter six cylinder diesel with 265 horsepower and a two liter four cylinder diesel with 190 or 150 horsepower. The smaller diesels, you can also get a six speed manual gearbox. And for the 190 horsepower diesel, you will also have the X drive, so the all wheel drive, which is then still having a rear wheel bias. What do we expect later on? Also an M performance model for the petrol side with more power. And of course, later, later, a true M3 and also a new plug-in hybrid. There was one before, but then the new one has supposed to be 60 kilometers of pure electric range. Well, that's the official figure, maybe realistic, then maybe something between 40 and 50, but definitely doubled than before. And now to our conclusion for today with the all new BMW 3 Series, the G20, as it's called on the internal code. G21 will be the later touring or estate. Well, for sure on the exterior it is rather an evolution again and they have to do that because it is their core identity product even though if SUVs are gaining more and more momentum and the X1 is you know probably also the most popular model now this one here still stands for BMW itself as a brand and will of course remain important. So exterior, yes, evolution, but definitely sharper than before. And also due to the technology changes, a base 3 Series will be sporty to drive as we expect already from the base setup. On the interior, there are even a little bit more changes. So you have a little bit more room to move around that makes it more spacious. They also step up the game into the build quality, for example. Very interesting also to see the different trims we've um, shown you here today and more digitalized, of course, especially if you have this big screen setup, which we've seen with a good resolution. And it's not overdone. That's really important to me. 
So um, it's not that you have a super tech fest and don't know where to get around, for example. However, with the uh, instruments, I'm still the analog instruments fan, is, you know, especially for rather, let's say, all-time classic like a 3 Series. And good that we especially have more room in the rear now. The Touring then will give you more versatility for the trunk area for sure. But the very important thing here with the new 3 Series is about all those technology changes because you know, if you look at it and then put it to the older generation, you might think, yeah, not so much has changed. But, you know, talking about the weight um, changes they have done, the new dampers, that's actually the thing I'm looking forward to most in our full driving review. How do those new standard adaptive dampers perform? And, you know, you get some more equipment like the LED um, lamps from standard equipment, LED on the interior, and also use those new dampers. But BMW promised that the price will relatively remain the same as for the previous generation. And two details I was missing earlier. With the wipers here, for example, you now have this integrated system that the nozzle is integrated so it won't, you know, spray all over the place. So it's, you know, definitely a more efficient system. And the autonomous emergency brake also belongs to this, um, you know, standard equipment an optional with a new assistance system package for the ACC and so on and the blind spot monitor what you are also used to. That's it from me here today and I hope you enjoyed our exclusive coverage here at Autocool you're always among the first ones to see the all new cars and I hope we will also see you at our full driving review of this new life. Coupe or coupe? How do you call those cars? And well, there has been a lot of discussion about this. It's always repeating itself. And on the Paris Motor Show, I want to ask a French designer, Thierry Metros from DS, about this very question. Because he has to know. So what is it? Coupe or coupe? It's coupe, of course, because we are in France and we said coupe. So can you explain why? Why? Because a coupé is a good word to use, huh? because uh, uh, as you know, a coupé, a coupé is, is a fastback uh, silhouette, the rear is very sporty, very dynamic. And I think le, the word coupé came from the French language. The origin is, is uh, French. So it For basically sure. means cut, like in coupé means it's cut. In it's cut, it's cut, yeah. Because in French, when we said uh, I cut, je coupe. I cut, je coupe. A coupé, it's a, it's a short wheelbase, it's a short rear overhang, it's coupé, definitely. But it's interesting that when you say when, when you say we cut, it's called coupe, coupe yeah. but coupé means like the already cut, you know, like yeah. that it's... Yeah, because coupé, it's cut. And yeah. The final word in French, huh? because when it's cut, it's coupé. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> okay, so you got your answer, so whenever someone asks you, is it, is it coupe or coupé, we now have the answer, yes, it is Coupé. And just a very short impression here from the Peugeot e-Legend concept, because that one just visually is really getting a lot of attraction here on the Paris Motor Show. It is basically a retro concept based on the 504 Coupé from Peugeot that was built between 1969 and 1983. And you can see it has really some sharp edges, really cool. I really like the visual part of that one. The length is 4 meters 65 or 15 foot 3, 19 inch rims. And it's a pure electric concept, 600 kilometers of range. They say 450 horsepower from a 100 kilowatt hour battery. But that's just what they think about, you know, it's a concept vehicle. But they also said they might really do something like that that's coming close because the idea actually is to Again, get some retro design, for example, and also to you know bring something good back from the past and combine it with some modern new technology. Also, inductive charging is supposed to be possible. You're taking another look at the rear with those Peugeot lion claws. Pretty interesting. This won't be regulating to the crash safety for sure with those freestanding um, tail lamps. But I mean the basic structure, you know, with this freestanding roof, this could indeed come back again when we have the electric vehicles. So we might, with the electrification, see some retro styles and some comeback of the cars. Also seen with the recent Honda Urban EV concept, for example. The interior is, by the way, also very interesting. It will feature a 49-inch screen. And this car is also set to drive autonomously so that the steering wheel can basically disappear. But again, when you want to drive such a car, you really want to drive it on your own.
And here we can take a glimpse into this concept interior. You can see the steering wheel can also be removed, basically. Then there's a turquoise interior and this black screen you can see, oh, automatically opening or closing door. This black screen you've seen, it goes all over the vehicle in 49 inch. Well, the question is, what do you want to see on that? Maybe a TV or whatever when it's driving autonomously. And this turquoise microfiber, very interesting, the seat approach. So behind me you can see the concept vehicle and this one is the current mid-size sedan here, the 508. And the question for you is, which one do you prefer? We see here this more contemporary round design language and in the back this one is this retro, more edge style design language. Maybe it will relive one day. Would you like that? Let's discuss it in the comments. What do you think about this idea to give the car a retro design? There's something very interesting here on the Paris Motor Show. The Vin Group is the biggest private enterprise in Vietnam and VinFast is their automotive brand. And the interesting thing is they take the chassis or the platform from the previous generation of the BMW X5 and the 5 Series. And this one here is the, let's say, previous X5 generation. And they make their own SUV. And the people of Vietnam could pick the design and Last but not least, the design company of Pininfarina was employed to do this very design of the car. So it does not look like a BMW, maybe a little bit if you know, you know the basic shapes, but they've changed actually a lot in design. But BMW allowed them then to use the technology of their previous generation. Pretty interesting for sure. Also how it would look like on the interior. This SUV here is called Lux SA 2.0. Well, the name is not really that significant because you can't really remember it that well. You just remember the Windfast name, the brand name. This one looks a little bit like a DS maybe or like a Peugeot Tiger Claw. Interesting that it can change the design of an existing car in that way. Of course, BMW wouldn't sell their actual new platform to them. Since we're here at the rear at the SUV, um, let's see. We can open that in any form. That seems to be closed. No opening. Sorry, no opening. But what we can see on the inside is that it has a seven-seater function. So those seats are flipped up at the moment. Of course, can be flipped down and for more trunk space. And let's take a look at the interior here as well when we go onto this moving platform. So here we go with the rear seats first. All sleek surfaces. Not sure if it's leather red or, or animal skin. I don't know at the moment. See here, you, have a, you know, the X5 has a problem that it doesn't have too much legroom already in the previous generation. Then here, nice ambient lighting you can see. Also matte wood trim you can see here. Well, the door buttons here are surely not BMW quality, so it's less quality there for sure. But of course, they also want to have it a little bit less expensive for their domestic market. This is the interior and in the front of this SUV version. Oh, the steering wheel does remind of the BMW from the form. But you can see the screen is oriented in a different way. It's more a vertical layout. And this is now based on the previous generation of the 5 Series. It's um, basically called the same, just a little bit different. Also, now rotating for you, I just check it again. It's called Lux A 2.0. So the SUV is called Lux SA 2.0, and this one called Lux A 2.0. 2.0 also refers to the displacement because they use a four cylinder engine with two liter of displacement. Yeah, I mean, for a big BMW, that would be a little bit too small, maybe. But you also have to bear in mind on the Asian markets, they have different regulations also where small petrol engines are being favored, for example. Interior right here, you can check it out as well. This is the sedan rear then. Those rear door shell, those rear shells from the seats remind us of a BMW as well. But this one would probably not happen in a BMW. Even this, you know, surely pre-production models and also look in the interior right there. There again, you can see the vertical screen, lay, screen, uh, vertical screen layout. I think the ambient lighting is quite nicely done in this vehicle. You can see the horizontal bar that goes on all over the vehicle. I mean, also if you look at the middle console, there you can see it has definitely some less build quality than an original BMW. But still an interesting concept because they rely on basically technology that has been proven for a lot of years. 
using a previous generation is also not really bad because those stuff is really proven already. It doesn't have to be developed even further. And then they can, you know, sh actually save a lot of the development costs and just take that from BMW and then add their own design, which is, I think, somehow fresh and the design works, I think. We will give the question how it drives, but that actually, because the driving is more based on the platform, so the driving should actually be quite cool. So interesting that we can also see so interesting things at the Barrams Motor Show. I'd like to hear from you what you, you think about the concept and maybe also some fans from Vietnam watching this one here tune in. Tell us more because we don't get so much information about this brand, about the corporation in Germany or in Europe. So if there's some expert on this brand, please also just add some more of your knowledge in the comments. It will be very interesting. Here, by the way, again, a look at the LED daytime running light that forms this V. That's, I think, a very good idea because if you have a brand that stands for a V, then also adapt your daytime running light with it. Pretty cool. Maybe some other brands can learn from that too. The Mercedes AMG A35, a new entry model for the world of AMG, they say, and We'll tell you everything about horsepower wise and of course also about the styling and we'll start here in the front directly because you can usually get an amg line with a diamond pin grill this is not here because in the true amg model we got this horizontal dual fin front grill to make it a little bit more aggressive and also this is the so-called edition one with more aggressive spoilers there's also an aerodynamic package here at the each sides and we'll also see more about this Edition 1 aerodynamic package later on with the vehicle. Also very nice blue color, don't you think so? Headlamps come with halogen, halogen in standard with the 8 class and then you can optionally get LED or here the optional multi-beam LED also with the high beam function. 4 meters 41 or 14 foot 5 is the total length of the A-Class in this new generation. It's 12 centimeters longer than the previous generation. And you know that so far the A45 was the entry-level AMG, now the A35. So later on there will also be a 45 again. Here, usually it starts with 18-inch rims in the 35 trim. Those ones are special 19-inch trim with golden nuances. This is also part of this so-called first edition. And we also have contrasting mirror caps here with a dark frame. That's also a signal for the AMG models to make it a little bit sportier. The dropping line also has the usual A-Class right here above the door handles. You can see the dividing in light and shadow. Also then with the contrast lower spoiler right there. Also the 35 will get bigger brake discs. And we can already see it right here. This is also part of the aerodynamic package usually it would just have a small rear lip and i would also go for that one because i think i mean it's a little bit too much or what do you think so i mean if you want it to be you know really screaming out you can go for this aerodynamic package and also add even more spice to this very vehicle in the rear also a normal a class in the new generation appears a little bit wider yes it is a little bit wider but also those horizontally drawn taillights make it appear even wider and then the 35 here has especially in the first edition a massive rear diffuser it will be a little bit smaller without this aerodynamic package and exhaust tips but again they are just exhaust tips the real exhaust is on the inside but we have one on each side and let me tell you something about suspension already Normal For a normal A-Class you get a normal suspension and an adaptive suspension. The AMG models come with an adaptive AMG suspension, so that's also planned for the A35. So what's under the hood? The 2-liter 4-cylinder turbo petrol engine here with 306 horsepower. And the acceleration figure to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour is 4.7 seconds. So, if you think about the previous generation A45, had 4.2 seconds so 0.5 seconds is the acceleration difference but I mean it's already pretty decent so I guess we will not lack any power with this one soon we will also be able to drive it and then you can check out the full driving review and then of course we'll also compare it to the predecessor A45 of course a new 45 then will have more horsepower or will it even be a 53 mm, well we'll see but we can uh, calculate that the one above that, the AMG model above that, will then probably have more than 400 horsepower. But again, as I said, probably more than enough here. 
with a 7-speed DCT equipped with the automatic gearbox and for more stiffness just under the engine they have another aluminum uh, span just right there for additional stiffness so they also changed at least something with the chassis to give even more torsional stiffness to this very car. Also has come with all-wheel drive as a standard and as this car has a predominantly front-wheel driven platform it is basically front plus rear-wheel drive but they also try to ensure that a lot of power is always transported to the rear wheels to have this rather sporty experience maximum then 50% front 50% in the rear for example when you use the launch control which will also be available with this vehicle now let's take a look at the interior so here we go and the AMG models have a lot of Dynamica microfiber here on the inside very cozy and sporty same time um, the top part here is um, drawn with leatherette, really cool from the build quality so it's a little bit soft and also feels and looks good. Seat control right here at the inside of the doors. You can also fit reasonable some you know bigger bottles at the inside of the doors right there. Then those AMG entry badges, AMG floor mats and also aluminum pedals to hit the throttle or the brakes. Also you get those new AMG steering wheels so they have a flat bottom you can also get them with um, Alcantara at the sides, for example, around the steering wheel, pretty cool. Then those turbine vents, you see the new air vents right there, and also a leatherette dashboard, really like that. And you can see those sport seats, so you have two different forms. A base sport seat with Dynamica microfiber on the inside and leatherette on the outside, sustainable and sporty, I would recommend you to go for that one. This one here is the optional sport seat with the same surface, but you see more shoulder support. So if you go to the racetrack, this might make sense for you to be kept even tighter. If you more wanted to use it as an everyday race driver, then probably go for the base sport seat, save the money for the optional sport seats because they are a little bit slimmer, stiffer, so they reduce the comfort just a little bit. Again, it depends really on what you are using it for. So like this you know you know you fall into the seat a little bit more you can control it in an electric way here it will be easier when the door is closed of course then you sit really low with those seats so lower than you would usually sit together with a little bit lower suspension you get a very sporty feeling you feel actually like in a true race car although this is just a compact hatch so but that's also the secret of the a45 before and now the a 35 the new entry model so there's no panoramic roof in here so you still have a lot of headroom a size 1 meters 86 or 6 foot 1 you see also when you're tall it's no problem you have a manual control of the steering wheel right here but you can you know have a wide reach as well there are a lot of controls on the steering wheel some are optional of course um, I will soon show, tell you more about that but again, the position is quite racy and even if those are the optional sport seats, so at first sight they are actually quite comfy. So it's also something which they have improved from the predecessor generation because in the A45 before, when you sit down in those performance seats, it was like, yeah, cool for the racetrack, but hmm, on the long-term run. So those here seem really already a little bit better. But as I said, if you seek more comfort, then the base sport seats will also do just fine. Now the interior overview and clearly you can see those turbine style vents. Wow, I mean, you have to like that, but I do. <laughs> do you as well? Please leave it in the comments. Then this huge steering wheel, it's maybe a little bit big, but I mean, like the geometry to where your hands are coming from, actually, I think it's quite fitting. And then those lower pads here, here we'll be able to pick the driving modes. It's not powered at the moment. And on the left side, you can pick, for example, the suspension modes to make it a little bit stiffer or softer, than depending on the situation. Gear shifter automatic is here on the right side. Put it down to drive. And then you will start with seven something inch on the left side. And you have the 10.25 inch on the right side. And optional, you can see the setup here with one element, basically two. 10.25 inch left and right. There are no analog instruments left whatsoever. And with your left thumb, you can control the stuff in the left screen then when the car is properly powered. And on the right side here, use your right thumb to, you, to control this screen. It is also a touch screen here, however. So that's also new in the new A-Class. See it right here. 
also works quite well and is a great resolution. And the third method would be using this touchpad here in the lower area to zoom in and out, for example, as well. That's possible. Or go back to the home screen. Then the climate unit is still accessible in a manual way with a clicking sound. I like that because when you're driving, you're sometimes maybe not so concentrated to do something in the screen. And you can also use the Hey Mercedes command, so when the infotainment system would be properly powered now, then it would also respond as for the new MB UX system. You can, for example, say set temperature to 22 degrees. The lower part, you can have some cup holders and also inductive charging pad for your smartphone. Smartphone either with Bluetooth or with the um, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto connection is available. You have a camera system too dynamic mode to be put in for the driving mode also here or as I said at the steering wheel. At the steering wheel it's optional though. Then we have, um, let me first show you here in the front, this is basically also um, like a, it's, it looks like at the steering wheel with this perforated dot structure, really cool, it's also a soft surface and then again leather red on the top part of the dashboard and a Formula One style sleek decor element Everything rather in a dark style, but I think you will also be able to pick some different um, decors for that. Rest of that, for example, at the inside of the door, we see um, brushed aluminum. I'm not sure if Holger can show you that here, for example. There it is. So here there's brushed aluminum, also in a very uh, clean and sporty style. And last but not least, this is just to put your hand on when you, you know, control this middle, um, middle touchpad. And then we also have two USB-C ports right there. So they are all now about USB-C. I don't have USB-C devices yet, so I would need an adapter. But if you have USB-C devices, this one may, may, will make your life a lot easier. So let's now get in the rear because you buy this as an everyday sports car. And since the car is 12 centimeters longer in the new generation, this is also the thing that has massively improved. First of all, the inside of the doors, also the nice microfiber use. It's sporty and cozy at the same time. Again, also with leather red cover also in the rear part. Really cool. I like those details. Then you see it does fit with, with my knees. Um, it will be a little bit different than with the normal seats. We have to compare it also. It will be very interesting. But I mean, it does fit for tall adults here also in the rear. Also headroom wise, this is okay as well. So yes, you can drive this car with four tall adults and have racing fun at the same time. Interesting also, look at that. Even the rear seats have the same, you know, microfiber on the inside, leather red outside, and also have an integrated head restraint. Hey, we have <laughs> rarely seen that with rear seats. So also interesting that they kept this racing style for the rear. You can also flip the seats already from here, but of course we'll soon show you it also from the trunk. There's no, um, no middle armrest here, but you don't necessarily need it. Isofix on the outer, se outer seats each, but the middle seat can also be used. However, there's this middle tunnel for the all-way drive and yeah, headroom wise you can sit here. You have to put your, you know, your feet left and right to the middle tunnel. It is possible to use the third seat, yes, if you're okay with uh, with your feet then. And also in the rear here, we have two more USB supplies and they use two USB-C supplies here for the rear. So I would buy an A35 if I don't want a pure sports car, but indeed also want to use it, for example, not only for having fun, but also to go to the groceries. And well, this new trunk, 370 liters in the new generation, interesting thing is it's 20 centimeters wider right there in the width and also almost 12 centimeters longer so you can see you can fit more stuff in here and before that it was like this you know with the lights with the rear lights so this is really the biggest step forward in the new a-class generation where also the sporty models then profit from so in the lower part some sound stuff is installed and then you can also flip the seats Right there. So, uh, there it is. So, this way it goes all flat. It's a two third, one third split, but you can also just put the middle part if you just want to load longer things through. And now, to our conclusion, 
static premiere here of the A-Class A35 AMG. You know, with the naming, they officially have it now Mercedes AMG A35. But I somehow still think, you know, A-Class A35 AMG. Which one do you think makes more sense? However it is, I think it's a good approach to offer a new entry-level AMG because not everyone wants to spend so much money on a car and thinking about the normal A-Class, already expensive enough, starting at around 30,000, then even just with extras, a normal one like a A250, you can easily get to 50,000 or something. Also in the 50,000 range, I th expect this model here, depending also you know, what extras do you pick for that. But the horsepower, I mean, is, is already enough and will have a great performance for sure. We will show that when we drive the car. So I think it's good to offer just a level below that. And also the interior has been massively upgraded here in this new generation. So that's a big difference for sure. And cool seats, also sporty seats, then also with a combination of sportiness and at the same time they also offer sustainable materials. So what do you think? Especially also my favorite is that the trunk has been improved, more room there now as well. So indeed, this one here is one of the best everyday life usable sports cars. Or what do you think? People do not say that the Mercedes B-Class is the sexiest Mercedes, but lots say it's the most useful one and the Mercedes B-Class drivers really love their vehicle. Well, why is that? We'll find out with the new generation of the Mercedes B-Class. It has been redesigned from scrape and also the interior has been changed and you can already see from the exterior one of the tasks for the engineers and the designers especially was to make it look less like a classical van. And you see that the front hood is longer now somehow and it doesn't raise that much just a little bit first it looks a little bit like a blown up a-class or what do you think and now more details we have a magno gray matte paint here it really feels very well you can maybe hear how it feels really interesting this in the front grille here you see is a dual fin there will also be an amg line available then with a diamond pin grille the headlamps are now more horizontally drawn over a sportier front. Starts with halogen, optional LED, and then the top trim is this multi beam LED, which is also equipped right here. And indeed, it looks basically like an A class from the front, especially because they have the hood way lower. It raises a little bit, yes, but if you compare it to the B class before, this is also one of the reasons why it looks less van ish. Side profile you can see here, just a little over 4 meters 40 or 14 foot 5, so the length relatively remains the same, just a little bit longer, a little bit increase in wheelbase, but you can already see here again the hood is sportier than before, and also the side profile, a rather sleek design. It is still higher of course in the A-Class, you can see that design dropping line right here 19 inch rims those are the biggest one that are available therefore also you can see a relatively sporty style with this very car also in combination with the color then you have those upright windows very very important for the visibility from the inside to the outside and towards the rear it now looks also more like a hatch not like a typical compact van you're also with an elegant styling right there and you can see you don't lose too much room, so not those super sporty, strong shoulders, because that would actually reduce the space on the inside again. So what do you think about the design here of the new B-Class, also if you compare it to the previous generation? Well, in the rear, it definitely looks like an A-Class hatch now, also with horizontally tall taillights, as we almost see everywhere now in the automotive industry, and just a typical hatch rear, fake exhaust tip in the lower end the real one is below that and overall you see it's basically a compact hatch styling that's what I take from it and you know some might really like that because then the B-Class does not indeed look so much like a van so I think they have accomplished that task the question will just remain if the core elements of the B-Class will still also remain that you have a lot of room on the inside we'll see about that so as for the engines, there will be petrol engines, a 1.3 liter 
petrol engine turbo of course with 136 or 163 horsepower and diesel 1.5 liter 116 horsepower 2 liter 150 or 190 horsepower and the 2 liter diesel is the very new one will be introduced with this car with an 8 speed DCT the other ones will get a 7 speed DCT so looking forward to drive that and find out more about the difference and now the interior and the first thing you notice is look at those inside of the doors it's way slimmer than with all of the other Mercedes model. It's basically upright, so you don't lose space on the interior. Really interesting. They also use matte wood here. Really cool as a surface. Also like, you know, how they covered it here with aluminum. The door looks really different than all of the other models. Bigger bottles also fit right there, and you can open the hatch electrically right there. Then the new interior. You start with 7-inch screens on both sides, smaller ones then 7 inch 10.25 and then this is the top 2 times 10.25 inch left and right and forms one unit leatherette cover here on the dashboard you can get new steering wheel with a Distronic on the left side you can set the adaptive cruise control the autonomous emergency brake is standard equipment an extensive AEB is also available I would recommend that and then of course the this Tronic here with new traffic jam assistant. I can also recommend this assistant system. Seats, there will be different ones available. Those ones are the multi contour seats. They are new. The base seats will also do just fine. You also get also then alternatives to animal skin like um, leatherette or also fabric, for example, in Germany. So there will also be a lot of those available. They will also offer different massage functions, an extensive one, and also, let's say, a small automatic massage during driving that will then ensure that you don't get so much seating fatigue. So I'll put the seat now in the lowest position right there, that you can also rate the headroom. 1 meters 86 or 6 foot 1 is my height. And this is a panoramic roof and well, those cars are not built really for super tall people, it seems, so the headroom is a little bit limited right there. If you want more headroom, you have to go without the panoramic roof, then you will have a little bit more headroom. Steering wheel can be adjusted manually right there, you find a quite good position. And you sit quite upright. Indeed, you sit 9 centimeters higher than in a Mercedes A-Class, so that's a big difference and indeed it feels let's say more a little bit like an SUV seating position but the car itself does not feel like an SUV so you sit relatively low from the whole vehicle chassis but then again a little bit higher as for the seat so that's indeed a different feeling here in the B-Class than in an SUV well on the side you see you have a lot of room also when the door is closed the front dashboard comes pretty towards you that's always the case of the vans it's also said that you have three centimeters more shoulder room. So, I mean, that's quite cozy here. Can't complain about that. The A-pillar is also not too thick. It's just that um, for the sporty design, they tend to make the front windscreen a little bit smaller. So you cannot look that well to the outside if you compare it to the predecessor model. Still, it's absolutely okay still. So no problem with that. Head-up display will be available. I already see this gap here in the front of me right there and to check out more of the interior we now change the perspective so this new interior definitely completely restyled this is a big big change to the previous generation my favorite feature is the matte wood inlet here so here that's also matte material looks really classy and they also have this you know, very big span for the decor element. This can also be bought in an AMG line, for example, with aluminum trim if you want it a little sportier. Then also you have those turbine style vents. This complete unit is basically like in the new A-Class, especially if you have the maximum setup, but I mean the smaller screens will also do just fine. You don't need the maximum entertainment because B-Class customers often also want a more economical situation. Still manual climate unit in the lower part right there. So you have redundant controls, touch right there, touch with the thumb. And also this lower touchpad will also be available um, that you can control stuff. Yeah, here we go now. So 
depending on the loading time, maybe it takes something, you know, with the internet connection. So with the lower touchpad, you can also zoom in and out with the map. That's possible. Or zoom in and out. Here again, that's on the touchpad now. Or then on the touchscreen with a thumb. Um, that could also be possible theoretically, but usually you control the main menu with the thumb then, if that would react right now. Again, those shortcuts somehow sometimes not always powered for all the system functions. The left thumb then controls the left screen and also the Distronic Plus here. Gear shifting lever is right there that I could put in a gear, but probably people would not like if I would just drive away with this car here right now. In the lower area here I can have a cup holder, actually two. They are also a little bit adaptive. Inductive charging pad for your phone. You can also connect there with the USB-C port for the Android Auto or Apple CarPlay. Then camera system or driving modes will be put in right there. And then there's this armrest with two more USB-C ports. The new B-Class, the MBUX, also features the voice activation or voice control system. Hey Mercedes, How can I help you? set temperature to 22 degrees. I'm sorry, I can't set the temperature at the moment. Only because the car is not properly powered, but you see that the uh, system actually understood that I wanted to change the temperature. Hey Mercedes. How can I help you? Navigate to Cologne. I am starting route guidance to 15 Kamadinstras Cologne. Oh yeah, so we're driving to Cologne now. And depending on you know how fast the GPS is loading there, so you cannot always judge by that how good a system is. It always depends also how good the connection is. So it's always, you know. Um, hard to judge that. We also had it in a Tesla at some point. We had loading problems because of the internet connection. So here we go. And it's always hard to find out which system now requires an internet connection, which does not. So really hard to judge it always how fast and then GPS is. At the moment it seems pretty laggy. Um, yeah, so pretty hard to judge it properly. You can see here we are driving to Cologne now. So some things do work quite well with the system, especially setting the temperature and driving to, let's say, known cities. But if you get a little bit more specific, we also had it in a GLE, it still can have some problems. So the car is just slightly longer, 2.5 centimeters, just a slightly increased wheelbase and that should help us here with the rear legroom and indeed, this is of course a big advantage of the B-Class if you compare it to other segments. It's not that long, but still you have good knee room right here and you sit so cozy upright here, so if, I mean, I've tested also the A-Class here today, a sedan for example, and this is such a comfortable seating position in the rear, and if you are a rear passenger, you really love the B-Class. This is one of the best rear seating positions I've known. Also, you have a lot of room on the inside. If you look again at the inside of the doors, you can see it here in the, at the rear from the inside, they are very slim again, so they leave you a lot of room to the left and the right. So, here, just next to me, I have a lot of room left. Then also as for the headroom, maybe come closer. Come closer, I can open the door a little bit more. There we are. So, as for the headroom, you know, this panoramic roof does cost you headroom. But still, I mean, at the side, it comes close here with 1m86 or 6 foot one to the middle there's more room then, but again, if you have really tall people, maybe leave out the panoramic roof. You also have this armrest, then with cup holders right there. Same we also experienced in the A-Class. I mean, they're also built in the same, very same plant. And again, you see this, you have a very straight surface. That's why it's so comfortable. So when a seating surface is falling down towards the rear, that is not good to you know how your thigh and the pelvis is being positioned and you get this back fatigue. But here, rather upright, like on a good chair, and that's really comfortable. So, we can flip the seats right here. At the moment, there's no function to change the angle. What will be available by mid-2019 is that the rear bench will be um, actually movable by 14 centimeters front and the back. So you can vary then if you want more legroom, like this, the maximum legroom, 
or more room in the trunk. This will be definitely a helpful feature. This very pre-production vehicle not equipped with that yet. And not only two turbine vents in the rear, but also two more USB-C supplies. And here also a full 230 volt supply, depending of course on the market that you can recharge the laptop. But what the manufacturers do not think about is when you think about a MacBook charger, for example, that thing is so bulky and it will not fit in here really um, with the plug. This could be a problem. So the hatch has an electric hatch available. 455 liters is the standard setup. If you move the bench, 705 liters. And if you flip the seats, 1540 liters. Those are the figures, but let's look at the practical side. This is an additional floor mat you can order or not. This is a standard floor. And you have some more room, also sound equipment. There will be also a cover uh, later on. This is, of course, pre production models here. And you can see this is a very, very wide opening right there. This comes pretty handy. Then this cover you can also remove. Uh, for flipping the seats, you have to reach over here like this. You can also just remove the single part of the seat as a ski hatch like this. And let's see the maximum setup would be then if you flip all of those. You can see they fold relatively flat. And it will also be available by mid to 19 that you have a seat, a co-driver seat, which also can be folded all the way flat so you can load through even longer things. The Mercedes B-Class is not a C-Class convertible, it's not an AMG GT, it's not the most beautiful Mercedes ever, but with the new generation they have made it indeed less van alike, so more just compact size car alike, like a compact hatch, but a little bit bigger, a little bit higher, so a sportier, sleeker design, that's for sure. Do you like it? Tell me in the comments. The interior has changed a lot. It's a clean interior, of course, fully digitalized if you like. It will get very expensive if you go for this top screen trim, though you have to bear that in mind. The best is, of course, the rear legroom. Considering the length on the outside, you still have a lot of rear legroom. And you're also very flexible as for the trunk and the wide opening. And you have a lot of room on the inside. And you sit so well on the rear um, passenger compartment. So. I would really like to have this one as a chauffeur car, really, to just sit in the back and enjoy it. That's the biggest strength of the B-Class. So, yes, maybe not the most sexiest one, but if you think just about the facts, actually, price-performance ratio, especially if you don't go for the super highest trim spec, it is one of the best Mercedes overall, if you look at this factory side. And maybe with that new design, you also find it a little bit more sexy now. What do you think? Tell me in the comments. And also, Tune in to more episodes here from the Paris Motor Show on Autogefühl with Thomas and Holger behind the camera. This is the Kia e Niro, the electric version of the Kia Niro. That is already available as an inbuilt hybrid or as a plug-in hybrid, now the fully electric version. And the interesting thing is, well, it's supposed to start at 35,000 euros with a smaller 39 kilowatt hour battery, but there's also a bigger one, 64 kilowatt hours, and that one then supposed to deliver you a range of 485 kilometers or 300 miles. Those are the most important basic facts about this very vehicle. And it is very seldom because so far there are so many very expensive electric cars on the market, like those 100,000 euros cars. Pretty cool when we spin around, right? That you can first see the front, then the, then the side profile. But we still lack some affordable electric vehicles and this is surely one of them and actually this one you know this with this new WLTP driving cycle the figures should be quite close to what it really can deliver and you can see the design is not really that different to that one of the normal Niro you can check the normal Niro review on Autogefühl as well with the driving part here again you know with those LED tail lamps horizontally drawn it looks a little bit box-ish the car but then again, it already delivers you a lot of room on the interior. That's actually the advantage. So this one is a car that not goes, they say, the extra design all the way to make it super aggressive or sporty and then lose some interior room. This is really one that is also supposed to be very practical on the inside. We'll soon take a look on the inside once more again. But this one here, a very interesting aspect on the motor show as well. Even 
sporty from the driving performance because if you pick the bigger battery pack, they have even more horsepower output and then we'll have a 7.7 .7 .7 seconds acceleration to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour. 4 meter 33 or 14 foot 5 is the total length by the way, just to mention that. And let's see how much room we get on the inside and if it's any different than the normal Kia Niro. So here on the interior we had leatherette at the inside of the door, then hard pack materials here, but good window levers, look pretty slim, door pocket, optional JBL sound system. Then those seats look quite good. It's a could be a leather red. I'm not really sure they were offering it at some point. It depends on the price list. With some color accentuation, especially for the e Niro, Typical compact Kia steering wheel. And then we get some electric gauges that you can also see when the car is recuperating, so charging. By the way, they promise also to have a 100 kilowatt hour fast DC, DC charging for this very vehicle. But I always say it's more important that you actually have just a normal household plug maybe at home or then even better, a wall box that you can charge the car. Well, it is basically an existing car and therefore there are also not so many surprises on the interior, electric seats, manual steering column control. With the shifting pedals, you change the recuperation then, how strong it should be already says here in the symbols that's pretty easy then so you don't have to get used to drive an electric vehicle because it's pretty much you know a common vehicle you sit also pretty much upright it's like a crossover style i'm one means 86 or six foot one and that leaves you still plenty of headroom right there and you have a good view to the front i've already told you in the normal driving review it is a very good car because it has a decent price performance ratio it has a lot of room on the inside although it's not big on the outside so you can very well use it even as a tall person interior overview you have soft touch on the top of the dashboard that's cool then this infotainment system well it offers you all the functions for example also um, the navigation but it's pretty weird because you cannot for example really pinch and zoom it also takes a lot of time to calculate and stuff and it's really not the best software sadly they should really update that meanwhile however usually you would just go for the apple car and android auto and use that system then when you plug in your phone that will be better for you the ac unit it's still pretty classic and it's really feels good it's good quality and you can easily reach it with a self-explanatory car i like that Again, the compact steering wheel from this perspective. On the right side, you can set the cruise control and also control something of those digital gauges there in the front. And they look a little bit more, you know, spaceship-alike <laughs> than in the normal car. USB socket in the front. There's another one right there. One for connecting, one for charging. There's also a QI symbol, so you can also inductively charge your phone right there. 12 volt power supply and then this is all special for the EV mode, uh, EV mode or the EV car the parking the D and the N it's a special drive selector then for the electric mode and there's even a cooled seat available last but not least you have foldable armrest with some cup holders you can also adapt them a little bit and an armrest with some more space inside also with another USB socket so they have thought about enough charging possibilities. It is for sure not a super fancy car but everything is right where it is and you already know then from presenting it in an aesthetic way that you can very well use this car in an everyday driving situation. And now let's get in the rear and this is really superb again it's a short vehicle and well to put your feet under the seat in front of you that driver should put the seat a little bit higher then it's fine but other than that you have enough leg room still left you know it's maybe not the most comfortable rear seating position but you have so much room again over your head no problem and that's why i can use this car in so many different situations you can also flip the seats then from here in the one third two third split that's how it looks like then there's a middle armrest right there with cup holders. They're not adaptive, so kids look out, don't spill it. <laughs> Isofix on the outside of the seats. And here in the middle, we have a 220 volt full plug. And this should probably also work maybe for recharging a laptop. But again, 
why don't they create it in a more open way that also MacBook um, uh, chargers can actually be applied there. This could still be a problem, but I mean, at least they thought about something using also the electric power from the battery in this case. Very versatile the car. It just stresses the fact that it's really a very well usable car for everyday driving life, which is again not so expensive, but already full electric available. So and let's open the trunk, manual hatch and wow, again wow, wow, wow. I mean we had really good leg room and then we still have a long trunk left. This is maybe a little bit wobbly, but still okay, it's not too bad. We can surely live with that. Then here we have still some room left. Could even be you now fitting a replacement tire in there. And again, when I flip the seats, how we can see the maximum loading setup. Here we go. I just have to say with this vehicle, respect. 134 horsepower is the output with the smaller battery, by the way, and 204 horsepower is the output with the bigger battery. And indeed, we find an engine in the front here. Well, the reason is it is a platform that is also used for a combustion engine. Therefore, they also put the electric motor in the very front and you can see how much less space it actually takes. The charging port by the way here is in the very front. That makes sense when you park in the front of the way, maybe in the basement garage and have your plug just right there or maybe also at the wall box. There's always a discussion what is the right point. I think it's also good to have maybe one on each side but to the front it, you know it can make sense in a lot of situations. What do you think about it? And by the way the whole car here, the electric version, here also in a different color, it sits 25 millimeters higher and so they gained some height in there, put the battery below that, also added some step towards the rear end. And the reason for that is also that you do not lose any space in the trunk, also not in the height, you even gained some liters on the boot capacity. Pretty amazing. And as for the conclusion for this vehicle, it's basically standalone at the moment on the market if you look at the price performance ratio and especially at the range figure considering the size of the battery. There are cars with bigger batteries and maybe even higher range. But getting this 485 kilometers or 300 miles from a 64 kilowatt battery in the higher spec battery version, that's pretty unique and really speaks for the vehicle. Looking forward to drive this fully electric version here now and I think this one from the overall concept, what it's offering. Yes, again, not you know the most attractive car because it's not a super sports car, whatever. But from what it is offering, it is surely one of the best cars here on the Motor Show today. Well, this looks like a fun car. A little bit like a small Mercedes G-Class, or what do you think? This is the all-new Suzuki Jimny. And we'll talk about how fun the car really will be. We'll start with the exterior, we'll also talk about the interior and also the power and the driving figures. Join us on Autogefühl. It is indeed small, but it is still very strong in the front and also available in very fun colors. As we take this one, we'll soon also show you more colors. Interesting that also it will still be fully off-road capable, a leather frame chassis still, classic standard all-wheel drive, permanent, also with an off-road gear reduction and approaching angle in the front 36 degrees and in the rear even 48 degrees approaching angle. That's really a lot. 3 meters 65 or 12 foot is the let's say shortness of this vehicle and you can see the SUV wheel arches. I mean it's not really an SUV it's really an off-roader and if you think yeah and G-Class looks cool but it's too expensive well this one here will start below 20,000 euros or dollars so that might be an alternative and it gets along in the city very well because it's as I said just so short you're also cool with the offset of the tires then with those you know with this uh, fairground building we have installed right there from Suzuki very interesting what do you think do you like it design wise I have to really say you know I just love it because it is so unique. And the first glimpse at the rear, this is really still a box design. 
too bad that it only scored three stars in the Euro NCAP crash test. So some more colors here for you, for example with the white and the black plastic fenders have a bigger contrast and here I have no problem when they use plastic on the outside because this car should be rugged. Even more rugged is this military look in the dark green. If you want it more like forest alike. You won't go fast anyway, the maximum speed is 145 kilometers per hour and you're also just in a grey paint, the rather subtle look. 15 inch rims by the way, this is not about big rims or whatsoever, you need a lot of tire left that you can also have a good off-road profile. So this is again a car, you know, without compromise. I like that when there are cars without compromise. There are hardly any real off-road cars left on the market. And if they are, they're usually done pretty big and super expensive. What's powering this, this thing here? Let's see. Of course, no hydraulic struts because we don't need any luxury features here. Here it is. So it's a 1.5 liter naturally aspirated engine. Petrol, of course. 102 horsepower. Five-speed manual gearbox. Or <laughs> the alternative would be a four-speed automatic gearbox and it's just this very engine somehow I like that too because not like with 10 different engine choices that's it live with it <laughs> and drive it and now the interior well it does not have the G-Class door closing sound but still <laughs> sounds somehow peculiar look at how slim the door is maybe that's also the reason for a bad crash test Seth. a bad crash test result Everything is really very, very basic, plastic-ish. Then again, you want to have a cheap vehicle. Same goes for that one here. Those remind me of the Ford Evans a little bit. Interesting that those gauges are also rectangular outside and round on the inside. Take a look at those seats, basic fabric seats. Here we go. Again, nothing special in the interior. This could also be a car that, you know, that's maybe a little bit older. Oh, the smell is also like a little bit chemical-alike. But then again, whoa. So this, <laughs> so you can only um, control it in height, not in reach. And you see the steering wheel falls down. It's not being held up. So you really have to like the unique character and I do and then probably you also say by the way this one is here for the for the you know the the angle of the back part here we go you can change that manually and the seating position is somehow cool you sit upright you have this great look to the front like in the Mercedes G-Class or in Land Rover Defender and there's a lot of headroom still left although I'm 1m86 or 6 foot 1 so no problem for tall people whatsoever and I really want to just drive this car. I mean, even if it's weird on some parts, for sure. This looks so much fun if you just look from here to the outside. You have to check that out. The rest of the interior overview. You have this infotainment screen here. We know it also from other Suzuki cars. It's the home screen. Then you connect your phone either via Bluetooth, but also the, um, uh, the Apple CarPlay, for example, is available when you plug in um, just the, the, the plug then or the Android Auto. This one is the GPS. It's a pretty simple one, not with the best soft, but I mean, at least you have one, so to say. Volume can be controlled right here, but also at the steering wheel, that's also possible. And then, well, the steering wheel itself, it's pretty compact. Again, look to those manual gauges, not digital at all. And then in the lower part, you have those vent function and also still a manual climate unit pretty easy and self-explanatory and then this one here is the five-speed manual gearbox again there's also the four-speed auto available and then there's a separate lever then for the off-road gear reduction so it's also possible to get in the rear although we have, don't have a separate door if you go to the co-driver side and then fold the backrest then you can slide the seat forward and actually have a quite easy entry to the rear and for example here we have one flipped down at the moment and the other one flipped up and then you have those emergency seats there in the rear I mean you remember the car is extremely short but can I get in there oh I smell comments Thomas in the rear, rear seat 
yeah, it, it, it's really easy to get in. And let's see if I can, yeah, I can really adjust the angle of the seat. You can see here, this is more upright, this is more leaning backward, or then fold back again. Again, very easy. You do not have to learn this vehicle. And I mean, headroom wise, I have no problem in sitting here. It's absolutely okay. And well, it's just a flat bench. So you sit relatively flat in here and the knees are bent quite a lot. But then again, well, I do fit here, even if someone tall would be driving there in the front, you can of course move the front seat here on the co-driver side a little bit more to the front that would be possible um, but what is more interesting is let's say i'm driving as a tall driver as the seat was there do i fit there with the knees directly behind it well well this is some task now for me um no so you can see here this would be my knee and this is the seat so it's definitely just for emergency situations that you can squeeze yourself in there or maybe, well, you can put child seats here. So it's Isofix right there. Nothing for tall adults, but it's definitely good to have it. And I see so many people driving alone in their vehicles or with two people. So why not? Then at least this car does not need any more traffic space on the outside. And you can just either have the people in the back or the trunk. As for a true off-roader with a real replacement tire at the very rear, you open this hatch in the sideways way. <laughs> and then, well, this is officially 85 liters. <laughs> of course, not really usable. But then you fold down those seats and then you have almost 380 liters because the space is really square and also fits for bulkier items. Really cool. Also with a rugged material here on the back part of the seats. So again, there you go, and just the front seats hold the stuff back. I mean, it's really a very intelligent car on, on this side, isn't it? It's somehow so cute and cool. Well, and that's for sure my Thomas Blue color for today. This is the one I would pick. <laughs> I just love this vehicle. It was so much fun already reviewing it. I really look forward to give this one a go on the road and especially on the off-road track. This is supposed to be so much fun. Yes, there are surely some weird aspects about this car. Okay, the bad crash test result, yes. Also the interior is called very cheap, but then it's overall also a very cheap car and it is so unique on the market. There's nothing like it and therefore I like it. Do you do as well? Let's discuss this car because I think there's really a lot to discuss about that one. There is a new player in this segment of small premium SUVs is the DS3 Crossback and the very peculiar thing about this car is it will come as petrol, diesel and full electric at the same time. Well, let's hear more about that exterior interior and also the technology. The DS3 Crossback is supposed to start at already 25,000 euros and is on this new CMP platform, the first one in the PSA Corporation. And you can already see those optional LED matrix lights. Very interesting, so they give an interesting lighting function and the daytime running light, they're just in a vertical way right there. And this typical DS grill, yes, it's basically the same form that Audi is using, but the S has also used it for their bigger vehicles, now also for the small car. 4 meters 12 or 13 foot 5 is the total length here. So yes, it's indeed a small SUV. Here we also change the color. Hard to see that in that Paris Motor Show light here. But you can see here there's a contrasting roof color. The door handles flip out that you can actually grab them. Hmm. Strange. There we go. Hmm. Not that I would say that I'm the biggest fan of this system, but Mm, let's say it's indeed something unique and what's also interesting here we got those special rims those ones here are 18 inch they even have a structure on the rim interesting and they also want to be really soundproof so they for example use a special insulation in the glass so so far the French manufacturers they weren't like top of the game when it came to sound insulation with the DS3 Crossback, the PSA Corporation, so Peugeot, Citroën, 
in DS, they want to change that. Really looking forward when we drive the car. So far, we can tell you something more about the features. And, by the way, you might know that from the normal DS3, so non-SUV, this reverse shark fin, this characteristic line was carried over also here to the SUV version. Well, now we changed the car again, so a very colorful review for you. So this purple color, very interesting, and the tail lamps, they are also just very slim with the LED daytime running light right there. In a similar style than the bigger DS5 crossback has. In the lower part, well, this is a little bit exaggerated with the exhaust. The rear ones are inside. This is then the, the outside tip, right and left each. Well, when you have the electric version, you won't need to care about that at all. But overall, I mean, the rear, I think, is quite cool and quite modern. The side profile really looks like the normal DS3. So what do you think so far? And yet again, another color, a very striking red. This is fitting the car very well, I think. And you can then also play with the contrast roof and black. Then according to the black rims again, and the red logo on the inside, I think this is the concept which works the best. This one's also the DS Performance line, so to add a little sportier touch. So on the combustion engine side, well, you don't get hydraulic struts, <laughs> but you get petrol and diesel with 100, 130, or the petrol also then with 150 horsepower. So that's the classic choice then, if you don't have any charging possibility at home. And the electric version, they call it e 10 It also comes with a special paint. See this crystal white color, very interesting. And this one then will also feature a Frunk, a front trunk. We cannot open it yet because it's a show car and they have basically deactivated the function. But there will be some storage area for the cable, for example, underneath. The battery capacity will be 50 kilowatt hours and the car is supposed to deliver you a range pure electric of 190 miles or 300 kilometers. And also a quite nice boost with this 136 horsepower. 8.7 seconds to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour. So actually quite promising figures. The battery is not too big, but the car is also quite small and also, you know, waiting for a price on the electric vehicle there. But I think it's an interesting concept, a small electric SUV. At the moment, only Kia is offering that. So this could really very well work for all you guys that already have a charging infrastructure or plan to do so. So you see here the charging plug will be a lower left and then let's take a look here at the inside of the doors, plush materials, very interesting geometrical forms. Well the door pocket is not too handy I think for bottles. And then here this interior for the electric vehicle is also exclusive for the electric version with a wide steering wheel, also wide accentuations right there. The columns are known from the normal cars, also Peugeot and Citroën. Then we have those beige seats or white seats. They look pretty cool and pretty bright. They have a fabric or cloth insert on the inside and on the outside. Well, I don't know yet if it's leather red or real leather, but what DS is doing is that they now say, wait a minute, we have a new idea of luxury. Let's use leather. And of course, I mean, that's not really a new idea and um, rather something from the past, but there will be different trims available, not only colors, but also different materials later on. So, the seat here is a manual one. This is a pre-production car, we have to bear that in mind. Um, so the functionality here is, well, it works everything basically. You can see you can also adjust the steering wheel in height and reach. It feels actually indeed very small, the whole car. Um, and also the interior is let's say pretty much built around you just the middle console is quite open um, but I can already tell you it's not something that would be really suitable for really tall people um, just from the seating position it's a little bit strange but best is when you pump it a little bit up then the seating area is a little flatter I'm on it's 86 or 6 foot 1 without the panoramic, panoramic roof I have enough headroom that's pretty really fine but with my knees mm, I think I have to put the steering wheel all the way up and maybe all the way towards me. Then it does fit better with the with my knees. So yes, headroom plenty, but you see here with the you know with the leg situation, that's maybe a little bit um, hmm, not optimum for taller people. Interesting also that we have small digital gauges right there, 
another big screen horizontal 10.3 inch in the width it's enough but if you look at the gps maybe not sure if it's high enough um let's see if that works here and yeah here we go so soon we can take it also in a detailed look right there so you have those capacitive buttons here also to change the climate unit for example and then change it right here it's quite highly placed so you don't have to look away so much from the street but then again you sit very low in the car although it's a small car that's a little bit strange indeed maybe also due to pre-production i don't know this area here is a little bit like the designers thought let's do something completely different no matter if it makes sense or not <laughs> i mean you have to you have to say yes they were very daring and it's really completely unique that's you know i can think we can agree on that start stop engine button here in the lower part also has this pulsating heart basically then again this compact steering which is quite sporty interesting and in lower part we have an automatic gear shifter electric motor just has one gear that's enough and also the window levers as we know from ds5 crossback are right here and not at the inside of the doors So the infotainment screen here again on close-up, if you, for example, change the temperature. And let's take a look at the GPS also once more. Apple CarPlay and Android Auto will also be available, by the way. So you can see how it looks like. View of Paris. So could be a little bit more responsive and I'm not sure why they are, are they not using the outside elements here. Hmm. I don't know. And then you can also check some vehicle functions, for example, the uh, parking aid. Oh, that's in German here. Interesting for our German viewers. Um, the hotkeys are placed pretty far away. You can see Apple CarPlay and Auto will also just work. So Holger wanted me to show you this structured roof. It really, f You can really feel the structure. Also a unique idea here for the electric model, by the way. They say also DC charging will be possible up to 100 kilowatts. So now the rear, you can see that those reverse shark fin design element leads to a limited visibility from the inside to the outside right here. So you just have a small hole right there. And also you see rear leg room. I mean, it's a small car, you have to know that. Um, so I hit uh, my knees just here at the driver's seat. Headroom wise again it's totally fine, the car is pretty high and you still have headroom as a tall driver but just you know knee room wise you have to live with that. Here again the seats have the fabric mix on the inside. You can already flip them from here in a one third two third split. We'll soon take a look at how it looks like from the trunk if that's even possible to open here in the electric version we'll see about that because some still looks pre-production in this vehicle but at least they were daring enough to show this car here already right here on the Paris Motor Show. So now the performance trim from the inside, ah, way to go. So it's not entirely hard, also not super soft, but soft enough on the top part then Alcantara use here on the middle part and that looks way classier. Sorry about the light, it's just to show you um, on the booth. Then those seats here, take a look at those. And those ones are the fabric mix on the inside with a red and that, that should be leather red and on the outside so that's the one i would actually go for to have a sporty racy touch and they also keep you warm in winter and cold in summer so yeah also alcantara use then here on the dashboard that looks pretty pretty cool so which one would you actually go for also like those ones here better also have ds performance 9 floor mats then right there in the lower part and also aluminum pedals you can see them right there i think we should take a look at that just from the rear perspective once more there it is this is the cockpit overview then or the interior overview from the rear here in the ds performance line you can for example see again this geometric structure in the very middle part then also with a darker trim overall. Well, I like the bright stuff than with the electric vehicle, but this one here, of course, looks a little bit racier. So taking a seat here in the performance line, ah, hmm, I'd like to hack the Alcantara. <laughs> well, interesting about this car is really, I tested it once again because 
I was curious if you had maybe a different seating position with the electric vehicle, or if it's just um, you know about that. No, you have different. You have actually the same seating position here, also in a normal combustion engine car, also with the performance line. Seat form is not different; just the surfaces are different. But if you have the seat all the way down, you sit so low and doesn't really fit to the whole car. But indeed, even if you're a tall person, you rather pump your seat up, yaw, and then you sit a little bit better, have a better overview. Of course, the steering wheel has to move up accordingly and maybe towards you. That's a clever idea. But indeed, if you have the seat a little bit more upright, it more feels like an SUV and also somehow fits better to the overall position of the car. There's, by the way, also a small head-up display in a separate plastic glass here. So here, in one more trim right there. So this is also dark trim, but then also, again, all about animal skin in this case. But just to give you an overview about the colors and trims they are using. The trunk is either open at the key or at the very low button right there. And let's see, it's 350 liters. Well, it is limited, definitely also has a loading sill, limit in the length, but again, you have to bear in mind, it's not such a long vehicle. So we have a replacement tire below here, and we can also flip the seats. Oh, that's nice music here. <laughs> so, there we go. Once, I have to put the head restraints in first. Here we go. And that's your maximum loading capacity. The DS3 Crossback is obviously a design object. So, and with the designer, Thierry Metros from DS, we want to talk about exactly that. So what was the main goal when designing this very vehicle? When we designed this, uh, this car from the beginning, uh, we started this project. In fact, we are very lucky because in the same time, we have the opportunity to work with our engineers on the new platform. And it's very unique in, in our uh, everyday uh, life uh, to work on the platform and at the same time on the design. And it was possible for us to have a very good proportion. We discuss a lot with our engineers of the good uh, size of the wheels, for example, to have the good uh, size of the wheelbase, to have the very good proportion. Because a good design, first, is good proportion. It's the first point. Uh, second point, of course, is how we can integrate and how we can um, design new technology. And on this cart, we support a lot of new technology, a very innovative technology for this segment of car. We have, for example, on the body side, the flush door handles, which is just fantastic in terms of design because we can keep a very uh, pure and very simple body side. Uh, it's, it's completely slick. Uh, could be way, very well uh, integrated, it's one point. Uh, for example, uh, about the, um, the way how we integrate the side glass, it's a rubberless integration because you have directly the, the body, the steel, and the glass. You have no rubber, nothing between the, uh, both. And it's, it, it makes the, the graphic of the car and the perceived quality very uh, perfect. Uh, about the, the front, the main goal was to, um, to integrate new technology. It was the opportunity to have a very thin uh, headlamp and we integrate the matrix beam technology, which is unique in this segment of car. Uh, we have uh, this rectangular uh, light signature and the three uh, LED modules. And it makes and it gives to this car a very specific uh, highs and a very, um, a very, uh, with a very strong character and a very special uh, feeling. And this one here, the performance line, the sportier touch. Uh, what did you plan with this one? Is what is your favorite one? It's one of my favorite. I love all the DS3 Crossback, in fact, because all, all of them have a specific character. For example, on the performance line, uh, we have the textured uh, black painting on the wings. Uh, on this one, on the green one, the blue millennium one, we have the uh, shiny chrome finishes. On, on the edition, limited edition La Première, it's textured uh, black. And all the car is completely black. And I love the way how we can personalize this car. You can choose, for example, the color of the roof. Uh, it could be black, it could be red, it could be white. You can mix uh, the color of the body and the color of the, of the roof. And it's very, uh, it's very amazing to play with your car. So if you desire any other color, talk to this guy and maybe he implements some more color codes to this palette. 
Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> so, and always a short conclusion here about the DS3 Crossback. A very interesting vehicle here for sure because on the first end it gives you so much variation as for petrol, diesel, all electric. Reminds me a little bit of the Hyundai Ioniq, which was hybrid, plug-in hybrid, all electric. Well, this one is a little bit different approach and definitely we need more full electric small or compact SUVs which are also affordable and not only those 100,000 euro electric vehicles. And here they offer a transition that you can still go for petrol when, for example, <laughs> the neighbors in your basement garage deny to install a charging station. Let me see. Oh, that's in my case. Therefore, I'm a little bit angry about that. Yes, I am. <laughs> but if you have a charging possibility at home, you can already go for the fully electric version. It's cool that they offer this possibility. And, you know, it's also something completely new for the brand now. It's one of the first products that will be all electric. Yes, for the, you know, standard production cars. There's the e Mehari, of course, this beach buggy, but not a real competitive car for the whole market. This one will be probably in all versions, petrol, diesel and electric. And the styling, especially in the rear, is actually pretty cool. In the side, it looks more like this normal DL3, the compact hatch. But of course, you have to like this extravagant styling. That's what they also stand for. They want to be really different. We've also seen in the interior that some functions might not be, let's say, form follows function, but function follows form. <laughs> let's take it that way. It's a small car, so you also don't have plenty of rear legroom, but overall I think the offering of room is still okay. In the front it's a little bit cramped as for the seating position, and of course the lines, especially the performance line, looked pretty cool. What do you think about this concept of the DA3 Crossback, which is not a real concept car anymore, it's becoming reality very soon. This is an all new BMW 8 series, so they introduced a whole new series in the upper segment, this one then here is the Coupe with two doors. There will later probably also be a convertible, but so far the Coupe and soon we'll also be able to drive it. But so far, let's take a look at the exterior and the interior here at the Paris Motor Show in this very interesting sky blue color. A very widely drawn double kidney in the front and it, this one is the flattest light ever seen in this BMW. Also optional equipped with a laser light with 600 meters of range on markets where it is allowed. Strong lower air intakes right there and a very flat bottom for sure. The question is this very segment. Well, yes, it's not a very small and light sport coupe. It is more a coupe where you would also have some, you know, not understatement, but rather overstatement. I would call this segment here a representative coupe. Or how would you call it? 4 meters 84 or 15 foot 9 is the total length here of the 8 series coupe. And you might ask yourself, wait a minute, isn't there the 6 series GT? Yes, the difference is the 6 series GT has 4 doors. This one here is a true 2 door coupe. And also this one here is 25 centimeters shorter than the 6 series coupe. However, they are also thinking about bringing a grand coupe of this one here that would then again have 4 doors. Yeah, you know, those segments have become very slim and there are so many different vehicles, it's hard to really differentiate them. Best is to watch Autogofu to really differentiate them. 19-inch rims, it starts. Those ones are the optional 20-inch rims, so a little bit bigger. But the tire lip is protecting the rims a little bit, I like that. Then the contrasting mirror cap and the very flat roofline. Wow, look how, how low and flat this car is when I'm standing next to it. Pretty interesting. And then those very strong shoulder lines are formed out. A beautiful design work. Driving-wise, smaller coupés might make more fun. But of course, if you think about design, you can play a little bit more when you have more lengths to play with as well. What do you think about the design? So the rear hole has taken the shot here in the mirror. Very interesting because the car stands so close to this mirror wall. It's a very interesting rear for sure because this rear lip is basically forming a wing. But it's, I think, so elegant that it doesn't, ha doesn't have a separate wing. That's a good decision. Also, the tail lamps accentuate the width of the vehicle. This is the M850i, by the way. This car also comes with all-wheel drive, also a rear differential lock and the progressive M steering. So all the sports equipment come 
directly with the petrol engine at least with this package. And for the petrol you can also then get a special feature, the anti-tilt function for the M suspension. Well, it will not be available for diesel, soon more about the engines. Let's take a look at the lower end here. This is basically a comp grill and interesting, that is not pure black plastic. This also has a shiny surface, so great details. And well, the real exhaust tips are fake. Also, well, that would be too big, but on the inside you can see then one, two, three, four pipes. Maybe you want the car rather in black, that, that's how it looks like. I always like to show you different colors. And there's also a carbon package available. For example, we have a carbon fiber roof on this very vehicle here. What's powering this thing? Beautiful design here also. 4.4 liter V8 with 530 horsepower, 3.7 seconds to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour. And alternatively, there's a three liter R6 diesel with 320 horsepower and 4.9 seconds is the acceleration figure. Most probably this one will be rather bought and with a petrol engine because consumption might not play such a big role in this very price segment and you probably also want that V8 sound. But both are for sure available. Maybe the diesel if you are really commuting long, long ways with this vehicle as well. Um, the black vehicle is for example a diesel we've shown you but of course you can get either color with either engine. Let's take a look at the inside here. So you have really a good wrap around the door. Everything is pulled tightly. Also a streamlined design. Here this is the so-called Hofmeister Knick, the design language of BMW which was introduced with the coupes. Very interesting from the rear from the rear windows. Well big bottles will not really fit in there. And the entry cap oh, also says mm, we have a carbon core. Wow. <laughs> this is the 850i. The interior here also with the M Sporty steering wheel. And sadly, there's only animal skin leather available, no alternatives. Especially since it's also a sporty car, there should also be some alternatives being offered, for example, microfiber or a fabric sporty seat. But the styling and the form looks pretty fancy, that's for sure. And also check it on the inside so let's get here and well you sit relatively low but um, the seat form is indeed quite cozy and it is a big car but you still don't have too much room that's maybe the downside a more meters 86 or six foot one and there's still some headroom left at least what is cool that the whole seating also the a pillar is covered with microfiber that's really cozy and also has a great racing style you can adjust the steering wheel in an electric way. Here we go. And also the visibility to the front is a little bit reduced. And you know, here on the motor show, I see that as a trend, as designs on the exterior become, let's say, more aggressive, even sportier. And they will say, yeah, you know, the design now even sportier. But when you look from the inside, your visibility to the front is being reduced. You have to bear that in mind. Interesting finding here. So. I think I found a good seating position here. Pretty cozy, but at the same time very sporty. You are basically caged in a little bit also here with the middle console. Definitely oriented on the driver. And here also different interior color. Well, I think red would be a little bit too much for me. <laughs> Is it for you? I also take a look at the seats here. Hmm. Especially as a contrast to the black. A little bit too much screaming out. But some may like it. So we have all digital gauges, there are digital instruments and also this 10.25 inch screen and they all come from stand equipment. I mean if you pay so much money for a car you also expect that for a 100,000 plus car there shouldn't be so many options. You have also have a seat ventilation available right there. And, but here you can set the seat heating then in the display right there. So, um, yeah, maybe it's a little bit complicated that you first have to press this button and then you have to pick it on the screen. So, that's what you do. Well, the screen, soon more details to that. Just to tell you that it's a touch screen, yes. Apple CarPlay is available, Android Auto not. Apple CarPlay, then wireless or Bluetooth connection. Volume knob still with a knurled one here and you can have these hotkeys. 
You can still use this lower pad then to control the screen. And then there is this crystal gear lever. We also see it as an option in the all new BMW X5. Camera system is available as well, but usually it just works when the car is really turned on properly. There's a start engine button right there. And in the front part here, this is by the way the car key. We actually have exclusively that one here in Autogefühl with the M logo on the side, the colors. Inductive charging pad for smartphones, one USB, normal USB supply and adaptive cup holders. So those are the new digital gauges. You want to see them in action, then watch our new BMW X5 review or soon we'll also have the 8 series driving review, then we'll also link that one. So the infotainment screen, for example, you can check some um, data about the car and also a great visualization. Let me just use the hotkey to go to the map. Here we see BMW use a very crystal clear display and you can see the responsiveness is also quite good. Head-up display is also standard equipment. You can see this box here and when the engine is turned on, you will have a projection in the windscreen. So the middle armrest right there folds up and you have a USB-C supply. I mean, they mix it one USB normal in the front and a C in the armrest compartment so you can maybe have a good transition. I smell comments with a time code Thomas in the rear seat. Yeah, feel free to because that's what's happening now. You can already see here that when I have the seat to my driving position, although it's a really long car, there is literally no leg room left. So, I mean, it doesn't make so much sense to go in the rear here. However, if you fold them, they electrically or just go forward a little bit. I can enter then. So, I mean, you see, it's basically just a cave, a little cave in there. Um, I can try to enter, you know, um, like this. But then no one could be driving in this car. So um, maybe it's just maybe so for child seat or something. But then again, the question is, how will you be able to mount those child seats? Those are really just emergency seats. I can also sit upright here, one meters 86 or six foot one. So um, yeah, and when I then put push the seat here, I cannot even, yeah, like this maybe. And then uh, 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 I'm getting squished, but there's a safety mechanism. Well. A dwarf could maybe still drive the car now in the front, but yeah. I mean, it's not about the practicability of this vehicle. That's surely not about it. I mean, you have Isofix on the outside of those seats here each. It's just for two um, people anyway. You cannot fold them from here. Probably you can release them from the rear trunk. I mean, it looks so cool design-wise also in the rear, but it's nothing really to be able to sit in. So now the rear hatch in the trunk, 420 liters is the capacity. You can see it doesn't go up like a fastback roof or something, it's more like a sedan. That's of course a little bit disappointing as for the loading through possibilities. It is very long, yes, but very limited at the same time. So it is definitely a showcase of how can you make a car most unpractical on the most length at the same time. That's what comes with this very extravagant and so sleek and marvelous design. So you can also, on the top part of the trunk, release the seat. You maybe heard that. And then you can flip those seats. So to make it a little bit more practical, also limited in height, but at least you can load through longer things, maybe for your golf bag. And now to our conclusion, this one here, the new 8 Series, surely among the most beautiful cars here on the Motor Show in Paris. Not a very practical car, that's for sure. That's about about this segment in general. So really long, but still hardly any room on the interior. That's what comes with it. And of course, the extremely high price and a rather conservative setting all around also as for the use of materials. But again, styling, 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 that's about it. And of course, the performance, a lot of horsepower and also very interesting what they will do suspension wise, especially if you go then also with a rear differential lock and this adaptive M suspension, which also offers them the anti-tilting function just in the petrol, however. So we're looking forward to drive that one and see if that design also holds the promise of extreme sportiness 
maybe even on the racetrack. Usually Škoda is about a price performance ratio but price performance in a sense that you don't pay so much money but get also quite big car and also with a lot of room and stuff but here price performance is meant that this car is basically a performance SUV the Škoda Kodiak RS that scored in nine and a half minutes lap on the Nürburgring Nordschleife. We'll take you through it because you want to see this very vehicle here in Autogefühl. In the front you can get this one in here for the RS. This is the black grill. The sensors are hidden right there and wow, a Thomas blue color, original Thomas, that's how I like a blue color. The LED daytime running lights, very cleanly organized and of course also a stronger bumper and then those honeycomb plastic structures to stress the sportiness. Overall pretty impressive design. Or what do you think? 4 meters 70 or 15 foot 4 is the length of a Škoda Kodiak and it's the same for the RS of course. The difference is that we here get then 20 inch rims, pretty massive also in this big scheme then with the big holes, dual tone scheme. Dropping line right there, that's the normal one, but then you get additional bumper on the lower end to make it even sportier. Black frames around the windows and also black roof rates fitting to that. So definitely looks sportier than it usually does. And I think it does indeed suit the car. Or what do you think? And by the way, it also comes standard with a DCC, this dynamic suspension. So you have the adaptive suspension on board where you can also pick the different driving modes to make it a little bit stiffer in sporty situations or then softer if you want more comfort. And here in the rear, well, it's classic Skoda Kodiak, but then again, you got the VRS logo and also in the lower part, well, you got different exhaust tip, but again, those are not the real exhaust. They are pretty massive, those exhausts, but they are hidden behind it. So, hmm. yeah, I mean, they want to keep the design and make it even more attractive. That's why they do that with the exhaust tips. Interesting, by the way, that the Kodiak has this reflecting stripe here all the way over the vehicle. So what they're using here as for the engine is a 2 liter TDI, a bi-turbo engine with 240 horsepower output, 4 cylinder, 6.5 seconds is the acceleration figure to 100 kilometers an hour or 62 miles an hour. Mm, it's a little bit like you know the Tiguan R line we've been testing with a bi-turbo diesel. This is the same engine. It won't be available for the Tiguan anymore but it will be now for the Kodiak RS. Let's take a look inside. You can also get those Classic stuff you could also get for normal codec. For example, here those door protectors that automatically go in and out. Then inside of the doors, Alcantara is the scheme. Also then with those um, quilted structure. Then this carbon fiber style at the inside of doors. By the way, also plush materials for everywhere used. Leather red right there. Spot for big bottles. And then wow, what a cool interior. Of course, dark because it's sporty flat and steering wheel also with perfect structure it reminds of those audi rs steering wheels then this carbon fiber decor element right there already soft touch dash dashboard as well and then take a look at those seats really cool again also remind me of audi rs seats quilted structure then also with microfiber and again this carbon fiber style and on the outside so let's say carbon leather red we could call it so also sporty and sustainable and you can see they have a very wide seating surface so here you can also combine sportiness and comfort. I mean I wouldn't really take it on a Nordschleife because um, it's still an SUV and it does have some tilting for sure even if they could uh, score a great lap time but those seats are really superb. You sit really up, upright in this vehicle at the same time you have enough width in the lower seating area the Alcantara keeps you tight and also not getting too warm in summer and also not too cold in winter. Really great solution to spice up your codec. The steering wheel can be so wide reach actually and also in height so you can find a good seating position. A moment is 86 or 6 foot 1 and that leaves a lot of headroom still even though we have a panoramic roof installed right here that goes basically all over the vehicle. If you want even more headroom, you would leave that panoramic roof out. But here in the codec, it's actually no problem because you always have enough headroom here. You can also then left, uh, leave some light in there and it really goes all over the car. I can get outside and Holger can get in and show you then how far the opening is actually there. 
So you get full equipment in here also in the Kodiak RS. Again, that look at the steering wheel. Left side you can control the volume, right side you control the digital gauges. Now also with those digital gauges available, um, not often that we have seen them in the Škodas yet. So uh, you can have the GPS map on there, for example, but also different views, for example, than with fuel information, which could be quite high in this vehicle, also with the performance meter. Pretty interesting. Then, in the middle part, the biggest infotainment system with no knobs at all. Proximity sensor is still there. And you have a home screen, basically. You can connect your phone with Apple CarPlay or Android Auto or over this smart link system. It does collect a lot of fingerprints, but the cool thing is it's still very easy to use. So here we are, zoomed in with the GPS. There we go, it's a clear display and actually those navigation software were among the best yet because they're maybe not the super most fancy ones, but so far the navigation was always pretty much right when we had those systems. So I was always quite happy with it. Here a new destination you can put in the in lower left with the proximity sensor carbon fiber style decor element here too. Interesting thing is that we have two glove boxes. This one is the upper one. So again, a lot of storage area. Then in the rather middle part, we still have a separate climate unit. I like to have that still old school style. In this way, I'm somehow old school, IO2. Uh, camera button is there too. Here on the motor show, it's very interesting because you have also this 360 degree view. If you put in the reverse gear, it will be a normal rear view camera. Then you have this very big DSG sh uh, shifting lever, so dual clutch transmission, seven speed, inductive charging pad in front of that for your phone. And then there are some bottle holders in the middle armrest. It's also very well attached and really a lot of room under the middle armrest. So let's now get in the rear. And that's the great thing about this vehicle. I mean, those sports seats are a little bit thicker for sure than the normal seats you get but still you have so much legroom here and it's not a super long car the usage or the using of space relation exterior interior is just superb here not only in the superb but also in the Kodiak oh that was a great joke wasn't it <laughs> and also due to the panoramic roof you lose some headroom but still enough headroom for the rear passengers and you have such a great and comfortable rear seating position here and also this quilted microfiber used here on the rear seats it really feels very nice armrest here with non-adaptive cup holders you can also just fold the middle part down for reaching through and you can also with this strap here put the seat forward or then also change the angle just a little bit so I can show that here in my seat so I can put a little bit more backward for sleeping position or then a little bit forward if I want to sit more upright so really flexible the whole vehicle and last but not least I mean yeah it's you can take it on the notch lifer but you can also put the bench forward and backward and then you can make the trunk even larger um, and this is one of the rare cars that where you when you move the bench forward you can still actually sit here but just you know be flexible make it the way you like it so one of the best rear compartments at the moment in the whole automotive industry I have to say you also can optionally get climate unit for the rear passengers also with seat heating for the rear seats and in the lower part there's also a real plug 230 volts and another USB supply and 12 volt power supply <laughs> so the trunk of course does still belong so much to the vehicle and when you flip the seats, you can get a 2,000 liter setup. It's really cool. You have some more storage underneath. Two bottoms here, basically. And then you can easily release the seats from here, from the sides. And wow, what kind of loading area you got there. Well, I think you have to go around and then push them down just a little bit more. Here we go. And then they also are basically fixed. And this lip usually should stay down. Hmm. I don't know, haven't seen it with the Kodiak yet, but I don't know, what's the sense of that? Usually it should go down like this, but hmm, strange. Fact is that you have massive amounts of space, and I uh, also put my bicycle once in here in the Kodiak, and I could even have fitted like three or four bicycles in here. I just love this Thomas Blue color. I would pick this car directly that way it is, you know, Thomas Blue outside, Alcantara on the inside, 
really great stuff. And by the way, the all-wheel drive is front plus rear. But of course, since you have so much horsepower, a lot of the times also torque will be transported to the rear wheels. We're really looking forward to drive this one. Of course, it has more than enough power, that's for sure. With the diesel, you don't get so high in the consumption than you would with the petrol. But still, it will surely consume reasonable amounts of fuel. Surely a dream car, a dream SUV with a lot of room for the family where you can combine actually a big family life with a sporty car life. It's just a price that will, you know, has almost everything in it. But you can just calculate approximately 50,000 euros. That hurts, of course, for a Škoda especially. But it's for sure a great vehicle. Or what do you think? Let's discuss here the Kodiak RS. I hope you like that we brought you that exclusively. We always love to react to your wishes. The compact Mercedes A-Class is now also available as a sedan. And here on the Autogruppe, we also want to show you this version. For the European market, it will be built in Rastatt, where also all the other compact models are being built, A-Class and B-Class in Germany. The US market will receive one from the plant in Mexico and the Chinese market, the one from China. And this is also primarily thought for the Chinese market. But as I said, it will also be available elsewhere. Let's take a look at the differences here from the sedan to the normal hatch. The front is the same, hatch and sedan. The AMG line features this diamond pin grill, my favorite Mercedes grill. Sensors are hidden behind this 2D logo, but with a 3D ring around. AMG line also features stronger lower bumper lips. This one here, for example, an A250. That would be already a quite sporty version, also with the all-wheel drive front plus rear-wheel drive on demand. That's the system. Headlamps start with halogen, optional LED, and then those ones here are the multi-beam LED, also with a high beam function. 4 meters 54 or 14 foot 9 is the total length. That's about 13 centimeters or half a foot longer than the hatch. And of course, the front is pretty much the same. Rims 16 to 19 inch. Those ones are the top 19 inch rims here in the black scheme AMG style. Also with black frames here around the windows. And then, of course, the basic difference is that we have here then a falling roof line, unlike the hatch that would just end right there, somewhat like that. It will be very interesting how that one plays out for the luggage capacity later on. This one has, let's say, more elegance. In the German market, it's pretty much unusual to buy compact sedans. But for example, in the US, it is pretty common. It's very interesting that there are still some, you know, some of those differences of preference throughout the market. What do you think? Would you, would you pick a hatch or a sedan in the compact segment? Or maybe also, you know, mid-size segment is more about than a state or a sedan. Are you a sedan lover? In the rear you can see those horizontally tall tail lamps and this is more like a you know, smaller C-class sedan than visual wise. The hatch of course would just have this rear right there. Fake exhaust tips in the lower end, those are really pure fake. Diffuser here in this AMG line style. But overall I think design wise it looks quite cool. Of course, there are a lot of choices there now. You have the C-Class sedan, you have the CLA, which is already four-door. Then you have this now, the A-Class sedan. The question is, which one would you go for? I mean, it depends on the prices on each market for sure and what you really want. Um, this one here will be less expensive than the CLA, which is, I think, very, very expensive. And, well, trunk-wise, this is an advantage then also. You have 50 liters more. 420 liters then, so 50 liters more than in the hatch. So, you see, it's just, it's way longer. I see my, my arm completely disappears in there. And also it's quite wide to load the things in. That's also due to the new A-Class generation. They have fixed that because the tail lamps were going inward like this before. The only disadvantage is that in the hatch you can easier load bulkier things in and out. Here you are, of course, limited as usual with sedans. Some more space below that. Also maybe for sound equipment. Um, optional, you usually can also pick, um, pick some replacement tire. And you can also flip the seats. Actually, can you? There it is. <laughs> so you have to release it right here. 
So release it from the trunk, then go around. And here we go. So, again, limited in height right there. But again, you have a longer area. And some of our viewers from the South American market, for example, say we like to have close up, close, really close trunks where no one can see anything. And it would also be better, you know, against burglary. Burglary. What do you think? And to show you a different color here also in white, the new A-Class sedan, also with a special rim trim there, pretty interesting. Of course, there will be plenty of other color choices available too, but we always like to show you as many variety as possible. This one also in the AMG style trim, as you've seen in the front grille. Pretty interesting, those copper accentuations. Those ones are also the biggest size that are available, 19 inch. So here, uh, look under the hood. You start with the A200 with a 1.4 liter petrol, 163 horsepower. Then there's the two liter four cylinder, this one here. Either as an A220 with 190 horsepower, or then here, the very one A250, 2 liter petrol engine, 4 cylinder, 224 horsepower. Also available then with the all-wheel drive 4 Matic. And there will also be a diesel 180D, 1.5 liter with 116 horsepower. Suspension wise, by the way, there's a base suspension, there's a sport suspension, minus 50 millimeters, and then there's it's an adaptive, comfortable suspension. And it looks almost the same for the interior, for the seats. I'll soon tell you more about that. First of all, Good build quality here at the inside, leather red on the door cover. Then this has aluminum style. Also for bigger bottles, it fits very well. So what you already find in the A-Class nowadays, a build quality you maybe had just in the E-Class in the past. Then those seats, there are base seats available, comfort seats and sport seats. Those ones here have a little bit more shoulder support, for example. A little bit more, let's say, complicated than the base seats. Take a look inside and you also have um, nice seat surface materials. Those ones here are the optional animal skin packages but you can also have for example an article of full leatherette or also um, sporty Dynamica microfiber inside mix with the leatherette on the outside. So electric seat control, the lower part you can manual and lengthen right there. A little bit steeper right there. It's always complicated to do it here on the screen while the door is not closed. Seat heating is available and even seat cooling. The steering wheel can be adjusted manually. Here we go. And the question is with 1m86 or 6 foot 1? Well, let me put the seat in the lowest position. And well, with the panoramic roof, it does come a little bit close. I wonder, those seats seem to be a little bit higher maybe than the seats we just tested in other A-Class sedans. That's pretty close as for the headroom here at least when you pick the panoramic roof. I really wonder because for example in the A35 with the sport seats there was a little bit more headroom. Might be that those seats here are a little bit higher. So it does work for me but if you're taller then you should probably leave out the panoramic roof that will be easier then for you. Maybe like this, yeah. Interesting. So, and here in the front you can see you start with a seven inch screen on the left and 10.25 inch on the right. This an optional, the highest equipment level with all the screen all over the place, two 10.25 inch screens. You control with the left thumb the left screen and with your right thumb then you control the right screen or also then with a touch on the right screen. Take another look at that when you sit behind me. The interior overview, everything is very well organized. The leather red dashboard cover. Then you can see the two screen layout right there, but you can also, for example, use a touch function. That's cool actually. So um, the GPS map is also pretty impressive. It always depends also, yeah, I mean, that the car is not properly powered right there. So sometimes it can be a little bit laggy also depending on the internet connection. It has a very clean resolution. You can connect your phone via Bluetooth but also with the um, smartphone connection. And by the way, if you rest your hand on there while controlling the screen, you can see here a lot of fingerprints is being collected right there on the, uh, on the sleek black surfaces right there. 
So, but while driving, you usually use the thumbs, but they are only working when the car has the ignition on, and those are all in showroom mode here. Clicking sounds here with the climate control. Still good to have the manual one. In the lower part, you have cup holders, adaptive and inductive charging pad for your phone. And there's also this touch pad here in the lower part where you can also control the infotainment system with. It also has a haptic feedback. You feel it in your fingers. And the different driving modes, they make sense when you have the adaptive suspension that you tune the suspension and also how the car is reacting throttle input wise. Finally, we got some two USB-C ports right there in the middle armrest. Overall, everything you need basically and of course this new A-Class interior fully digitalized counts for the sedan both and for the hatch. And also a look at the darker interior without the strange red stuff. <laughs> this one also the so-called edition one. But those seats here with Dynamica microfiber on the inside and leather red on the outside you can also get for all usual Mercedes A-Class. Interesting mix and makes sense sustainability wise and also stays warm in winter and cool in summer. So also you see those other sports seats with some shoulder accentuations and I can really recommend you to go for this mix. So what about the rear leg room and also the headroom right in the rear there? So first of all, I do fit in here as a tall adult, even if a tall adult is driving. Not plenty of leg room, but it's still the compact segment. And we also see that in the A35 with the sport seats, with the slimmer sport seats, you have a little bit more leg room. Interesting. Headroom wise, yes, it's a sedan. It's a little bit longer than the hatch and it does exactly fit. My hairs already touch the ceiling, but you know, so it's a little bit more cramped than in the hatch, I would say, because the roof line falls a little bit, but it's still okay. So yes, you can use the car with four adults that are also tall. It does work very closely, but does work. Then some armrest right there with foldable cup holders. Isofix on the outer seats each. And we also have two more USB-C ports in the rear and also oh, small turbine vents additional for the rear. So the conclusion, the Mercedes A-Class sedan. Basically it offers everything the hatch is also offering with a little bit longer trunk area, a little bit more boot volume capacity. It's a little bit harder to load things, bulkier things in and out, that's the disadvantage. And the rear legroom especially looks a little bit more cramped. Other than that, thank you very much. <laughs> Other than that, I mean, I think it's a very useful addition because in some markets those compact sedans are really loved and you might ask yourself, yeah, you know, there are so many other like C-Class sedans, the CLA, but then again, I think this one makes more sense than the CLA because it will be less expensive and also features all the new stuff the A-Class is offering. Of course, CLA is more this design object and both will get pretty expensive very soon. So you also have to decide if you go for a high spec A class, you can easily buy also a lower spec C class. That's of course always a question, and especially if you go for a sedan. So it's time that we on Autogefühl also take a look at the Tesla Model 3, which comes with either 50 kilowatt hours battery or the 75 kilowatt hours battery in a top spec, then 300 miles or 500 kilometers of range. Of course, we take a look at the exterior design and also at the interior and the features. It's a very interesting car, that's for sure. Starting 44,000 US dollars. Customers still waiting for the deliveries, but we can show you more. What's about this very vehicle? Let's dig deeper. And we'll start here with the exterior. You can see it's a sleek design in the front. The daytime running light does look really different than the one from the Tesla Model S. So it's it's a easier composed. It has some kind of Porsche style in the front, don't you think so as well? Definitely in a very sporty way, also with a um, red color and very sleek, also very fluent forms in the front. So I think from the front already quite pleasing. 4 meters 69 or 15 foot 4 is the total length of the Model 3, of course shorter than, than the Model S. This one here is basically a mid-size segment. 20 inch rims mounted here but it also starts with 18 inch. 19 do also look okay. Those ones of course look bigger but they probably will also reduce a little bit of the comfort. 
cameras mounted right there for several several you know surveillance functions also for the side cameras then pretty interesting then the door handles are also interesting they make you use it with the right hand because if you use them with the with the right hand it's actually not possible um, or that you have to do it like this or something so it always makes you to use it with the left hand you can push the thumb in and then do it like this a little bit complicated to me this system there's a sleek side profile as well with a sharp coupe ending so to say and very strong shoulders again a rather minimalistic design that is also again sportively pleasing so in the rear we can see basically those typical tesla tail lights they do resemble also the other models here we also have a carbon fiber lip also says all-wheel drive well why yeah they're using in the top version at least two motors then to power the car rear and front and so you have the all-wheel drive although there is no physical connection what do you think about the design of the model 3 261 horsepower power output by the way and 5.1 seconds is the acceleration to 100 or 62 miles an hour so 100 kilometers 62 miles an hour and on the interior you can see they use soft touch materials it's all leatherette nothing is animal based to serve the sustainability of tesla in this case then also here big bolts do fit this is the button by the way where you release the door that you can open it again then the interior again is very minimalistic so even more minimalistic than the one of the tesla model s or the x you can see hardly any buttons at the steering wheel i will soon show you what those buttons are for what you can do with them and also the seats they available in white beige and black either with the full leatherette so again no animal source really um, good way they're taking there and they still feel very soft. And you can also, as a base one, get fabric on the inside and leather on the outside in black. Um, I mean, for the um, climate comfort that it stays cool in summer and still warm enough in winter times, I would even recommend you to go for the base version with the fabric on the middle part. This white one, of course, looks cool and bright and the leatherette surfaces can be wiped cleaner easily. So you know pros and cons for sure so sitting here you have the electric seat control and indeed it feels like you know in a like in a mid-sized vehicle headroom here is since we have the panoramic roof a lot of headroom left here i'm one made is 86 or six foot one so you can find a cozy seating position here you can control the steering wheel height and reach when you choose it in a menu and then you scroll this button here on the left side with the left thumb scroll down or up and the steering wheel moves if you've picked the right one in the menu and by pushing it right it goes inward by pushing it left it goes towards you so pretty interesting system um, it would have been easier to add a separate column but then again to keep it sleek and simple I mean, it's an interesting idea. Turning indicators are still manual, then the gear shifter on the right side. And also when you look to the front, all sleek materials, this is where the air vents are coming from. You can also change it a little bit then. So you have a very clear view to the front. And even more interesting to see when you get the driver's perspective, because what about head-up display and what about seeing the actual speed of the vehicle? So this is the huge 15-inch screen, just like a tablet and, well, before it was in a vertical way in the Tesla Model S and X, now it's on a horizontal way. And the interesting thing is that you, when you go to the vehicle settings here, that was the one I was showing you, then you can move the steering wheel up and down. And uh, soon we'll get more in-depth on the system because really a lot to discover here, but basically you do everything from here. And when you're sitting on the driver's side, the speed will appear on the left upper part so yes you can see it quite easily but i would really suggest to have a head-up display but it's not planned so far then again everything here when it's closed off that way it's again very simple and this simplicity is also calming to you that you stay relaxed when being in the car again soon more details to the screen right there what is also interesting is that in the front we have this black panel here in the motor show gets a lot of fingerprints and you do touch them so i'm not such a fan of it and you can put the first one up so you have an inductive charging pad and also a um, possibility to put your iphone um, on there like a 
charging box or also other cables then. And the second one here is mounted with a magnet and there's some space inside. Um, however, you have to close it very gently like this because when you close it harder, it will just pop back again. So gently here and never open it like this because then you might um, squeeze your fingers in here or scratch something. That's also not that, that well done. Cup holders and then they're not adaptive. And then you also have the armrest right there with some more room. So now at the screen, very interesting again, speed will be right there. The trunk, the front trunk, I can open right there as well as the rear trunk there. So everything can be opened from here. There's also a voice control available. I can activate it by pressing at the steering wheel or right here. But I tested some of the functions and it does not work that naturally as for example the new Mercedes MBUX system. Set temperature to 22 degrees. See, the system realizes it, but it's not really reacting on that, you know. So, well, let's try something else easy. Navigate to Berlin. That one is working, for example. And the good thing is here because Google Maps are being used. First of all, it's very fast, if you have, especially if you have a fast internet connection. It always depends on the internet connection then of the, of the car, if it's fast or not. Of course, it looks great here with the satellite view as well. And the good thing is when you want to search something, so for example, search for a doctor maybe, then you type it in Google or you use the voice command and then directly you know, click on it and just call or hit the navigate to. That's so easy and you ask yourself why not everyone would be using this system. However, what's not that good is when you um, want to connect your phone, you have to use the Bluetooth still. No Apple CarPlay or Android, uh, Android Auto available because they do not want to use the Java protocol because they say Java protocol would be potentially uh, dangerous for hackers to get into the vehicle. That's the explanation. Then seat heating is in the lower part here and the temperature unit will always stay here. So no climate knobs, but at least you don't have to access the menu first it's always staying right here and therefore you know basically where it is. So let's get inside. And if you have the seat in the lowest position, I have it I would be driving. I have to say the driver should put the seat a little bit higher because you cannot put your feet under the seat then. So when you have um, drivers in the rear, so passengers in the rear, lift the seat a little bit higher for better foot storage <laughs> under the seat. Other than that, it does fit with your knees still you know with one means 86 or six with one not that plentiful but I mean it's a standard mid-size sedan also as for this space you have this second glass roof on the top and therefore you also have enough headroom so that still fits with my head so overall it's actually a quite cozy position here again when the front seat would be a little bit higher that would be even better then we can also flip the seat from here already one third two thirds split again also the soft and sleek leatherette surface here we have in this very vehicle. We also have a middle armrest with cup holders right here. And we have two USB slots, normal USB slots also for the rear passengers. So let's check the trunk. It has the manual opening and it's um, not a, let's say, very close sedan, but it has some, well, sedan resembling loading sill some more space below that. The overall capacity is 425 liters if you include the front trunk, if we can show that very soon as well. So a lot of room here in the, you can even fit a cabin trolley in the lower compartment. And of course then even longer right there. And you can also then, when you have the seats flipped right there, also works to load longer things through. So now we'll open the trunk. Here it is. and. Well, it's a little bit dark here, but Holger can enlighten us a little bit with the light. So this is a perfect storage, for example, to put the additional cable that your rear trunk stays clean. Now to our conclusion for today with the Tesla Model 3. Well, it's a new mid-size sedan model right there. And yes, they have problems with deliveries. That's their key factor at the moment because the car itself, you know, from the concept, like the range it has and also the price well will not be cheap but way cheaper than still than the Tesla Model S but the overall concept with a simplistic concept is really cool 
a nice sleek exit design and also this interior. You can argue about the build quality for sure, but again, it also calms you down because everything is simplistic. So you have to like this, let's say, easy setup, but I think, you know, already in a Tesla Model S, it was somehow calming. Yes, I would like a head-up display. That would be very cool. Other than that, I think you can get along very well and quite fast also with the car. Also, the amount of room that is offered is also quite okay. Looking forward now to drive one because suspension-wise, that is sometimes also a weakness of the Teslas. But still, they have a great Nimbus. They have a lot of, let's say, uniqueness. They still have this unique selling factor because what we see here is still very different from the competition. And of course, if you think about the Tesla Model S, it's out there since 2012. And now, like six years later, the other premium manufacturers slightly come after that. So I can just hope that they fix their factory problems, that they can deliver more cars to the customers because, I mean, this car has a lot of pros and cons, that's for sure, but it's a very interesting and unique one. What do you think?